3,000. What is doing? My name's Maloney. This is the 3,000 Podcast. I'm joined today by a rapper, a battle rapper, Ooh. a stand-up comedian, mm. a vlogger. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, save some social media for the rest of us. Really, <laughs> thanks for coming, man. Thank you so much for having me, Maloney. <laughs> Did I miss anything? What else do you do, man? Uh, you do fucking everything. Yeah, I'm fucking not too bad at playing the spoons. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, I'm sure there's a Tazzy joke there and I'll leave that one yeah, alone. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> But Thanks for coming, man. I know that you, uh, you are originally from Tazzy, but you're now a Melbourneian and a lot of your story mm. lies in Melbourne and that's how we're mm. going to tie it in with for the sure. 3000 podcast. So, yeah. uh, man, we've got a lot to fucking talk about. Let's start at the beginning. We know you grew up in Tassie. You're a very t- proud Tasmanian. Mm. Whereabouts did you grow up and what was it like for a young Greeley there? Um, so I grew up just south of Hobart uh, in a suburb called Kingston, uh, which is kind of like the main suburban area on the south side. Um, for me, it was, uh, you know, like, yeah, the community down there was pretty good, mm-hmm. you know. It had its dodgy areas. It's had its good areas. For me, it was close to the beaches. There was two beaches where I grew up. So I spent a lot of time on the beach. There was like a blowhole where we'd go and like jump into the water in the summer. Yeah. Different stuff like that. You know, this is in the 90s. You had skate parks just being built in Tasmania. So, you know, the skate park became the local spot. Um, yeah. And uh, it wasn't until kind of... Uh, early sort of high school years that I kind of ventured into the city a lot more and yep. can be connected, you know. It is hard for kids in Tassie to get around because a lot of people on the mainland probably don't even realise mm. there's no public transport except for fucking buses, man. Oh, man. it's And the powers that be, bro, they make sure that there are no passenger trains being built. What? So that's an ongoing, like, thing, you think? Yeah. Uh, well, this is my theory yeah. is that the people that run Tasmania are basically in the bottom. Right, and they don't really want the top end to have easy access to come mm. down. Yep. There's a lot of, um, you know, if you look at the history of Tasmania, massive convict history. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's an island within an island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the there's so many people in Tasmania that are just descended directly from convicts. Yep. You know, after Port Arthur was shut down. There was, there was about 100,000 convicts that got sent out to Port Arthur over the course of about 50 years. So uh, many people, after they served their seven years for transportation, they got the fuck out of Tassie, you know, and they went and co- helped colonise the rest of the country, mm. you know, because uh, 1804 was when they first came to Tassie. By 1830, they were shipping thousands and thousands of convicts in. And um, so, yeah... A lot of people left and the people that couldn't afford to or weren't capable of leaving ended up staying there. Mm -hmm. So now if we get like six generations down, 200 years, a lot of those families that weren't capable of getting out all got pushed out and out and out. Um, Into more rural areas. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, so the wealthy in Tasmania choose to live in one area and they want everyone else as far away as possible from them. Yeah. So I really think that the reason they haven't got passenger trains is because they really want to keep the the sections in Tassie separate. And it's a, I guess it's an easy way to, to control the masses as well. If they don't have the means to mm. have their own travel, then they can fucking control them. Exactly. Like yeah. even with um, uh, one of the suburbs in Hobart is called Bridgewater and the blueprint that they use for this suburb is an identical blueprint for the same communities that they built in Compton in California, Mm -hmm. which were strategically designed to keep people in. And uh, for for the way that I've watched that suburb evolve over the years, you know, uh, it didn't have its own Centrelink. And so people had to leave this area to come out to Centrelink. But the locals got so angry of people coming from there, so they built its own Centrelink there just to keep them there. You know what I mean? Yeah. um, Unfortunately, yeah, there's there's it's like definitely... reverse gentrification. It's it is, like yeah. It, yeah. That's exactly it, man. I've never yeah. thought of it like that. Mm. That's sick. But um, yeah, reverse gentrification, mm. which is crazy now because Tassie's being gentrified massively. Yep. And so there's even even more of a large gap between uh, the people that have been stuck there for generations are culturally quite different, and all these people coming in. Mm. Yeah, it's very interesting, bro. For sure. So as a kid there, are you growing up listening to hip-hop or are you just like 
listening to mainstream music, I'm guessing it's kind of hard for kids to sort of, unless you've got older brothers or sisters or whatever, to sort of be privy to what's going on, what's mm. happening out there, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was listening to, you know, all the mainstream stuff as a kid, just what was on Rage, you know. I remember the first few times I started seeing hip-hop on Rage and the first time I discovered, uh, you know, Beastie Boys, mm -hmm. um, just all the, you know, the early Cali gangster rap that was still kind of getting played on TV. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, Burnt CDs and Napster. Yeah, mm -hmm. Napster came out and it was game on, you know. And the people sort of, it, it's a bit of a meme now, like the burnt CDs in the flick-through wallets and mm. LimeWire and all that sort of stuff. But that's responsible for a whole fucking shift in music and people oh, yeah. getting their hands on music. Yeah, and artists succeeding off it. And yeah. comedians like Doug Stanhope put his first special on Napster and that's how he became international, you yeah. know. And so there were so many artists that managed to jump on that train. Yeah. You know, Metallica didn't like it. But <laughs> Metallica didn't like it. But if you think about it now, if everyone if all these artists had their time again and if you were savvy enough, you yeah. could use that to your advantage well, and just it. be like put your shit out there. People mm. are downloading it. It'd be yeah, it was I think once the labels got involved, they're like, nah, these kids aren't having our music for free. Yeah. But it's totally that's the birth of like this whole thing that changed like SoundCloud rap and all that sort of shit. Mm. That was the start of it. it it really was, man. And it's interesting now watching where it's at and to think, you know, 20 years ago they're like, oh, they, they don't want – you can't give them this music for free. But now as artists trying to come up, you have to give your music out for free to just yeah. get looked at, you know. Like it was, yeah, interesting. Eh? It is definitely a strange time for music because people were still paying for music but everyone was consuming it for free and that was going to – that was a trend that – People power was going to win eventually. Mm. People were going to not pay for music in one way, shape, or form, mm. and that was a way that w whether we liked it or not, I think with the evolution of the internet, that was going to happen, and yeah. that was just the start of it. Straight up, man. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So a kid in in Tassie, and that's you've got access to everything else that everyone else has. All of a sudden, ten years prior, you wouldn't have had access to what music was happening. So all of a sudden yeah. you're hearing this shit yeah. that everyone else is hearing at the same time. Yeah, exactly. And uh, before the internet, um, you know, even the cinemas would have to wait longer than the cinemas on the mainland, you know. Which geographically it's not that far away. No, but it's still, I don't know if you know how they, there were these big reels, giant yeah. big film reels, and to get them down from Melbourne to Tassie was a bit of a mission back in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and same with fashion. All the fashion at the shops were last year's fashion from Melbourne. You know what I mean? So not only were we behind, we copped it for being daggy and just not fitting in, you know. Dude, and Melbourne would have been copying two seasons ago from the US. Exactly. That yeah. Maya would have got what didn't sell in Europe and the US. That's exactly and it, then it would have, Yeah. And my blessing really was um, I, it's my, I was born in America and my father was from there. And so I got to do a few trips back um, in the 90s and in the 2000s and so it was very interesting because I'd go to the place where this cultural source of Western media, whether it's, you know, heavy metal, hip-hop, fashion, skating, everything, everything yeah. you know, and I'd, I'd get chances to go over there and see what it was like and then I'd come back and I'd, I'd see how the culture was building. So I remember being in high school in Tassie and just knowing that hip hop was going to be the biggest genre in Australia yeah. and now it is. Man, that's like such a sort of step up because you think, all right, people from Tassie, people from Hobart want to go to the mainland to see what's happening but mm. you're not only going to the mainland, you're going all the way to the US. Yeah. So you're really getting a fucking glimpse into the future of what's going on. Yeah, no, I really did, man. And if we look at like so much Australian history and American history, culturally, politically, every aspect, um, you know, Australia has really followed America's lead. Like totally. that, They only actually dropped the white Australia policy because Lyndon Johnson, who's the president that took after Kennedy, um, when he asked Australia to be involved in the Vietnam War, uh, he said, you know, we've got this thing back in America called civil rights. So if you guys don't change your policy, the blacks back home are going to get angry. So that's so, one positive we can take out of all the stuff. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, sure. yeah. But it's very interesting in the same sense that like Australia doesn't realise what it's doing until America calls it out. 
And it was the same with like blackface on red faces. I was like, just about to say that exact same thing. Yeah. Harry Connick Jr. is like, yeah. nah, you don't do this. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And if you look, that's a lot of the history, True. you know. And yeah. like, I mean, Australia was being founded at the same, you know, I guess the beginning of the end of slavery over there. But it's it's very interesting analysing the two and analysing, yeah, the cultural differences, the history differences, you know, them having another 200 years of colonisation compared to Australia. But geographically, um, sorry to cut you off, yeah, but geographically man. we are so far away from the rest of the world. Mm. We are so far behind. It takes until there's something like the internet or media to be transferred quickly for people to realise, hang on, mm. we are not different for the rest of the world. We're just far away geographically. Yeah. So I think that was an excuse for a long time. People said, this is just how we are here. And mm. I'm, I'm guessing in Tassie especially. You 100%, know? Yeah. yeah. And I think that's, yeah, you know, until any sort of, I mean, yeah, isolation it definitely breeds not much change. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And, and um, yeah, it's very interesting to think of that, that like, yeah. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. So... When you go to the US, and I believe you might have even lived there for a period, yeah. and whereabouts in the US are you, man? I guess it's wherever you are, it's going to be very different to fucking Hobart. Yeah, definitely. I spent the most time living in Texas, mm -hmm. um, which was, you know, its own rodeo. Everything's bigger <laughs> in Texas. Yeah, yeah. And I was there when George Bush got elected for the second time, so I got to witness the political agenda and identity as well as just the culture, the pride, um, you know, from country music to NASCAR and everything around it, like, yep. got to experience that. But it, once again, man, hip-hop was the one thing I experienced the most over there that, you know, I took from it. Uh, at my time at school there, you know, people were having ciphers at the bus stop at the end of school. People were rapping. People were following hip-hop. Whereas um, in Tasmania, there were a few people that, list, you know, at school that I went to, a few people listening to Eminem, this and that, but no one was listening to Wu-Tang. No one knew who Razel was, you know, and yeah. I was blessed to to go down that line and follow these artists and who's they collab with, and you yeah. know, I just followed the breadcrumb trail. Totally. And uh, I think the saddest part is I found Wu Tang through Fred Durst. I remember that <laughs> happened. That shut the fuck up. Cup, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then I was just like, oh, and then yeah. just Wu Tang, and then you know, you like, know, Primo produced that song though. Man. Yeah, That's actually, why the beat's yeah. so fire. Yeah, straight yeah. up. Yeah. It's a bit of a shame Fred Durst rapped on a Primo beat. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> you could be the boss. Look up to the cross in the land of the lost or something like that. Yeah, but, yeah. but but Method Man sick on that track. Oh man, yeah, it was still a burner track, bro. Track, it yeah. was still alright, you know. My mate's brother had that CD, and I remember pinching it and then just listening to track twelve or whatever it was over and over yeah. again, man. That it was, uh, yeah. But it was also Primo as well. Yeah, definitely, man. Um, it's funny you mentioned Razel because around about that same time of uh napstar mm. i downloaded the razel you know you'd know it because you're the beatbox guy but mm. if your mother oh only... yeah and i listened to that a lot same here man that's yeah. where i did a lot of my early learning yeah beatboxing was downloading uh razel killer keller from the uk mm. um kenny muhammad dougie fresh yeah you know all the all those sort of guys and you were honing you were listening to them and then you're thinking i can beatbox a bit as well like yeah you... yeah well it's um yeah, I definitely took it on board, man. One thing I've really learned recently is understanding my neurodivergence mm -hmm. and, um, you know, for where I kind of sit in regards to the spectrum and how my mind works. And I, I really, when I like something, I go in, you know what I mean? Like deep and it's that sort of, um, you know, deep dive. And I realised that like beatboxing was like a bit of a self-stimulation thing. Mm -hmm. Like not only could I get obsessed with it, but when I beatbox, it was stimulating, you know. So I really, really got into it hard and would just beatbox all day, every day. And then once it became a thing that I realised I could, you know, make people like me with it, like I could go to a party and beatbox and people thought I was cool, yeah. I stopped the self-steaming aspect of it and I was more doing it for ciphers, doing it for this, doing it, you know, as a trick. And only in the last year that I've like been doing my kind of self journey of finding myself and understanding myself, I realised that it is a self-stimming thing for me. So I've been just like by myself 
in the house just beatboxing flat out for an hour straight, just going to my happy place, oh. eyes closed, just full doing it. So yeah. that's like a bit of a vibration thing. You're hitting yeah. a sort of thing and you're finding a rhythm. and yeah. Exactly, yeah. And it just gets me real satisfied. Yeah, <laughs> you know I mean? like, yeah for sure. Yeah. But so – in Tassie, when you or I'm, when you're doing the beatboxing, I don't know if you're in Texas or you're in Tassie, mm. but in Tassie, are people getting it? You're like, I'm making drum noises with my mouth. Are they? Do they yeah. get what that is? Well, I was doing it before Joel Turner, <laughs> who was on like Australian Idol. Yeah. yeah. So, but when that, that Australian, I remember when it happened, I was a bit like, Who's this guy. You know what I mean? Like, because yeah. I was. Um, Jealous. <laughs> but if anything... I don't think you would have traded career paths with him there. Man. No, 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 definitely not. I'm very grateful for everything in those regards. But, yeah, like, I remember a bunch of people being like, what the fuck are you doing? And it was the same with rap, man. Like, when I was in high school and... Because uh, I, cause I, I did a bit of high school in Tassie then I did a bit of high school in America. I was already beatboxing before I went. So my beatboxing skill is what got me in at school in America. Because as soon as fellas found out I could beatbox, they invited me to the ciphers, you know, yeah, yeah, and yeah. that was where I first started rapping. Yeah. But then I came back and I I did like the last bit of high school in Tassie and everyone was taking the piss out of me. You know, everyone was like, oh, he thinks he's a rapper, all that sort of stuff. It wasn't yeah. until I did something in Melbourne because I was doing gigs before I first came over to Melbourne. But once I did something in Melbourne, then people were like, oh, mm -hmm. you're doing it in Melbourne? Oh, it must be legit then, you know. And that's a big part of tall poppy syndrome. Huge tall poppy syndrome. Yeah. So you can go to the US and do something, but they're like, oh, yeah, this guy thinks he's an American rapper. Yeah. Oh, he went to Tassie. He went to, sorry, Melbourne. Then yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah for sure, It's like man. not tall poppy. It's like medium poppy's okay. Tall poppy's no good. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting one, bro. Tall poppy syndrome in general is fucking weird. And yeah. I've spoken to a few people about it lately. People don't like anyone doing anything that's that that they don't really understand that's yeah. mostly what it is it's people want to jump on board when you do it when they get it mm. but when they don't really understand it they're like oh, no, no no we can't have that yeah. and i imagine tazzy that's like tenfold yeah definitely massive stay in your place sort of syndrome oh this guy thinks you know he's got ticket tickets on himself you know that fucking but how do you get anywhere if you don't back yourself you don't you just you'll stay in the same place, place. and that's what staying in your placism is you know and um, yeah, especially in the last year since I've been on my spiritual sort of tip, I've realised that more than ever. Mm -hmm. You know, doing rap was a thing where people didn't understand it and they're like, what's he fucking doing? And now I'm talking about God, I'm copping that ten times more, well, you know, yeah. which is interesting. But and I think like, we're all guilty of doing it. Yeah, where yeah, somebody definitely. does something and you don't re – you're like, this guy's doing this or that's going to be a failure. And mm. then as you get a bit older and more mature and potentially try your own things, you go, I shouldn't have – been so dismissive of these people. That's what they want to Definitely, do. Definitely, man. Right? And that takes more courage to fucking try and do something like that than it does to stay in your place and do fucking nothing. Exactly, bro. And, you know, yeah, I, I definitely, like, I can see, I, I used to have the same perspective on pe what I'm saying now. If I had heard myself five years ago, I would have dismissed it the same, you mm -hmm. know. So yeah. I understand and I forgive. But everyone's on their own journey at their own different times. Exactly, man. And that's the hard bit is, like, when you're having a big awakening and it's so... You know, you're like, whoa, and, and you're trying to share it with people. A lot of people aren't in that same section of life and a lot of people don't want to take it in. Exactly. Yeah. And like you said, 10 years ago, if someone said that to you, you'd be like, don't come at me with this preachy shit, man. I'm doing my yeah. own thing. That's you do you. But that's just understanding that everyone's on their own journey at their own fucking time. Exactly, man. Yeah. Speaking mm. of journeys, let's get back on your journey. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so you're coming to Melbourne now after you've sort of – you've done your, your – look, Hobart, you did your – School, then you went over to Texas and you went back to Hobart mm. and then you finished school eventually. Do you finish school? No, nah, no, nah, I didn't last very long um, at school and uh, it was a bit of a turbulent environment at the family home. So I I think I, I lasted maybe two months after I got back from America. So and like year 10, year 9, year yeah, 10? Yeah, I moved out I like moved out by myself when I was in year 10. That's young, man. Yeah. It's like, what's that? It's like 15, 16. 15, 16 and... I rented a room with um, a couple, I lived there for a bit and then uh, then it just ended up on the street, man. It just really went from... Living on the street. As a 16-year-old kid, you're on the street. Yeah. That's yeah. fucked, man. Yeah, no, it was pretty shit. And I went and stayed at all the shelters, but, you know, they all had strict curfews. So it'd last a month or two at the shelter before you get kicked out. And then there was two shelters in Hobart at the time, so I'd try and bounce back between them, but... Um, yeah, wore that out pretty quickly. 
And As so I tried to do like grade 11 while I was on the street. And then I'd like, fuck man, you know, I'd like sleep in a car park, still get up, go to school, or like I wouldn't have enough money for the bus, so I'd like hitchhike to school and I'd get there an hour later and then the school would still just tell me off and shit. And I would was the school like, intervene and be like, okay, well, this is this, this kid is only still 16. Yeah. He needs some sort of help. Is there any help no, out there? No, was, there wasn't really help, you know. Centrelink. Yeah, I got living away from home allowance. Rest in peace, Eve. She was my first Centrelink worker right. and she was a darling. And yeah. I went in there when I was pretty heartbroken and in a hard place and... I remember I was getting like 500 bucks a fortnight and that was like big dollars back then for a fucking 15-year-old. Like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can sort of take the piss out of Australia as much as we want, but at mm. the end of the day, though, their services are really there and we are lucky to an extent yeah, when it definitely. comes to, to money for people that need it, you know. Mm. Like it could be better, but we do have it a lot better than other countries. 100%, man. Yeah. But, yeah, it was, it was interesting. The school definitely didn't take my situation in consideration. Luckily, I had a good music teacher that understood that we were passionate about hip-hop. Shout-outs to Phil Grinham. And he would let us just do what we want. As long as we were recording and we weren't fucking around and mm -hmm. we got some shit done, he was like, good, you know? Yeah. And, yeah, he was the only... That was the only thing I actually ever committed to at that school when I didn't finish grade 11 or 12. I just kind of went for a little bit and smoked bongs in the bush, you know? And that's where, like... Definitely, under, you know, discovered a lot more drugs and things like that and getting out and connecting because I went from growing up in one suburb but once I was on the street, I had mates from every side of town. So, you know, you'd end up missioning it out, crashing on this couch up on the eastern shore and then out at this couch in Glenorchy the next night and then this couch down in Taruna. So, you know... Is there other kids within this scene though as well? Is it not just yourself? On the sort street. Of yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. for sure. So it's a, it's a, it's a, almost a culture of, of there's other kids doing it too. Yeah, yeah. Well, not just kids, I guess, people that are... Yeah, adults. just, yeah, like, so, you know, and that's this is still going on t today, same sort of shit. Like, when I roll through Hobart, I know the young young people on the street, you know, they know me. And um, it, it really reminds me of the exact same thing that I went through, you know, and I try and talk... Because it, it comes with so much fucking nasty trauma and shit totally. you know and like and if people are on the street that's usually because they've come from trauma and then as well they're inflicting trauma on each other yeah. you know so yeah there was um definitely there was a culture of it there was lots of hectic shit that happened man like you know people dying different things like that when you're squatting in dangerous places we're squatting in abandoned buildings one day we were um me and three fellas went down to this abandoned bank to squat and a random drunk guy followed us down and he was like 30 and we were like, fuck off, don't follow us. Because um, we actually had to climb up on the roof of this abandoned bank to sneak into it. Mm -hmm. And this guy like followed us and we're like, don't follow us, don't come on the roof. And he did. And then once he got on the roof, we're like, if you're going to walk, follow the nails. And because he had to follow the nails, walk around this bit to get into the window. You know where the beams are. Yeah. yeah. And he's just run out across the roof, fallen through it three stories down and he hit the bottom and died. Fuck. Yeah. And so we, we didn't know he was dead at that point. We just freaked out, went down, ran back downstairs. Uh, this bank was right next to an old pub called Joe's Garage, which is a bit of an old school bikey pub. And, um, yeah, we went and tried to kick the door in and then the bouncer from the pub saw us and called the cops and we all had weed on us so we all bailed. But, yeah, found out a month later that the guy died. Shit like that, you know what I mean? And just, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty hectic, man. Yeah, man. It was like, I don't know. There's, and there's still, there's, I see the butterfly effect of those years in my life to this day, you know. Mm. I won't say any names, but I'm going to share this one because it's fucking something that was very confronting for me. Yeah. But I was on the street with this one guy who was a nasty fella and I, could, I knew he'd been through a lot of like sexual abuse and... Um, and then a couple of years later, I saw him walking around with this other young fella that was on the street. And I was like, mm, that's sus. You know what I mean? And then only like three months ago, I ran into that young fella and he was telling me that he's going to go rape another bloke to get back at him. And I realised in that moment that that's what he went through when we were all on the street. You know what I mean? And, and I said to him, I was like, just because it happened to you, brother, doesn't mean you can do it to someone Someone's else. Someone's got to break the cycle. Exactly. You know what I mean? But mm. it's, it's, you know, it's a very interesting one, the street like that, because my life's changed in so many ways in different places. I've travelled the country and everything, but I can't disconnect from 
the community. And if I walk through the street and people talk to me and the way that I remember a lot of stuff, my, I'm very absorbent in that way, and all these little memories and add up, I can just see so many layers of trauma, man. It's hectic. And that's it. Mm. I don't think anybody intends to end on the st street in any capacity, but mm. when they do, it's generally mental health trauma, mm. the two main factors, and then drugs, obviously. Yeah, man. And potentially all three. And as well, like, we've got to remember that we've built this culture up that the street is the street. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. there weren't streets here before we put the streets here, yep. you know, and yeah, it's very interesting, man. I feel that like I've really been on a journey of kind of trying to decolonize myself and my mind. And the more that I do, the more I can see the fear in, in the system and people within the houses and everything like that. I feel as hectic as it can be, I feel very comfortable in the street still. And, you know, I've got a lot of love in my heart and that overcomes fear every time. Yeah. Um, but yeah. The street is a, like you said, pre colonization, then the street is just outside. That's the land. Yeah, that's yeah. country. Yeah, exactly. So to feel comfortable in the street is just being comfortable in the outdoors. Exactly. Yeah. When you break you, it down. But yeah, isn't it? And, and it, But here we're at this point of like, do we get to the, the point where we're so conditioned to the boxes that we're in that. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's an interesting it's one because, yeah, the more I like, especially travel the country, you know, I spent a lot of last year working in up in Darwin with a lot of young mob up there that are from our country. And, you know, the crime up there is hectic. Mm. But this is what happens when you, you take, you know, a culture that doesn't live in that environment and try and force them into a culture. Of course, they're going to be on the yeah. streets stealing cars when they come from a culture where it's a free economy. Yeah. Of outside because it's their country, you know what I mean? Like it's it's a very it's yeah. a, it's no it's an extremely tough situation. Yeah, and you can't impose rules on people where that you, they're not their rules; they're yeah. your rules. It no. doesn't, you know, like well, that's the that's the L A W versus the L O R E. You know, <laughs> yeah, and exactly. It's, yeah, it's very interesting because you know in their law you can't be greedy, but then they come into Woolworths, mm, greedy bastards. <laughs> you know, like. It's, it that, makes sense, man. That's the problem with this whole – with the law, LAW, mm. is that we let corporations be greedy but people not be greedy. Sort yeah. of thing. And that doesn't make any sense. No. So what we're, we're basically holding corporations higher than we are people. Yeah, man. And that's fucked. And, like, if you look at history once again, it's the corporations that make the laws. That's why – you know, that's why the, the cotton pickers made weed illegal in America. You know what I mean? They were the, not, they were the cotton picking industry, you know. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, the corporations pay off the lawmakers to make the laws so it suits the greedy and the 1%. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, – that's a whole – Yeah, it's other, a big yarn. <laughs> but let, let's get back yeah, on the, yeah. onto your journey. So, but yeah. obviously, the streets, man, that's tough there. But you're doing your thing. You're doing your uh, – your hip hop thing, your beatboxing. Are you meeting other people? Are you thinking like from that are like minded, or are you thinking I got to go to Melbourne to sort of make something happen? No, I definitely I came across the local Tassie hip hop scene. I met an old writer from WA. Uh, he writes High Five, MKA, H I S A Five, H I G H Five. five. Yep. Yeah, and he's um he's S B X O G. Yeah. He was good mates with Hunter. So, yeah. Right. And um. He, he brought so much hip-hop into Tassie. There was already a local scene, but once I met him in a park uh, just down in Salamanca, he was there listening to Biz Marquee on his boombox, hanging out with his dog, yeah. drinking some goon. And, um, yeah, I just went, Biz this Marquee. Is my guy. <laughs> yeah, I was like, Biz Marquee, I knew him, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and then he actually put me on to uh, the first Tassie hip-hop that I found on mp3.com, which was like uh, Topsky, D-Dare, Raman. Uh, that was some of the early rappers in Hobart. and They're probably rap that you got to listen to their music even if you are burning it. You yeah, know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. They would have been like, if the kids want it, fucking take it. Yeah, yeah. this was just like a free download, like, mp3.com.au yeah. yeah. thing. Yeah. And so that once I found that and like as well, you know, it was like I'd been so neurodivergently obsessed with all this hip-hop that I was finding and practising. Once I found hip-hop from here... That was when it was just like, all right, boom. And then I met them. They became my friends. I found out there was like local rap battles down in the waterfront. 
So I go down there and um, and I was underage and I just hang out the front and wait for people to come out for cigarettes and just start beatboxing yeah, to get right. their attention. And then within time, I was just like beatboxing for the ciphers during the gigs where the people were having outside while in the smokers section and mm-hmm. uh, slowly made friends with the guys that were, they were they, all these guys were probably mid twenties, you know. Yeah. Um, I was only a teenager, but at the same time, I, I met a few guys through the main park in town. I met a couple riders that went to Newtown High on the other side of school. I met like two or three guys that rapped and were doing their thing and we, we just formed a big park crew. Yeah. Um, and that was the summer before I went to grade 11. So when you mm. say you're 16, when I was 16, I was fucking a little tiny kid. Yeah. Are you a big 16 year old? Like, or are you still like a little kid? Like, are you like a? Yeah. Are you, are you, could you get? Could you have snuck in there, or are you still look like? Oh a yeah, no, I managed to sneak into a few places. Did the old car key trick. You know, you walk in <laughs> the car keys here, yeah, mate. I'm an adult. You know what I mean? And yeah, yeah I, I, you know. Especially in the those years on the street, I definitely got a bit got savvy with that shit. Yeah. But um. But yeah, there was other pubs that knew I was underage and I couldn't get into. Yeah, I definitely was. I've always been a pretty big fella. fella. So then, that, and that would help. Yeah. Now, also, the other thing that makes me curious from a Tassie perspective, when you say the riders and stuff, we've established that there's not really any train, like there's no mm. like no uh, passenger train lines. There's not a whole, there's not a huge metropolis there. So what are the riders like? Where, where are they riding? Where are they? So what are they hitting? There's a main tunnel that goes underneath Hobart. And it's yeah. called the Rivulet, and it's probably. I'm not sure exactly how long it is. It's the river that comes down from Kunani, which is Mount Wellington, and it comes down and goes underneath the whole city. Right. And a, it was a, 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 a car, like a vehicle, or is it a, a train freight tunnel? No, it's a storm drain. Oh, it's a, yeah, oh, yeah, it's a yeah, drain. Yeah, right, yeah. Right, yeah. Right, so right. a big storm drain tunnel. But okay. it's a big one. Yeah. You know, so big that's wide. A, and, yeah, okay. And so that was the main spot was the Riv. Um, we have like an old snake run, like a skate bowl, mm-hmm. and that was one of the early graph spots down there. Other than that was water tanks, you know, like heaps of water, because Tassie's like so many valleys and hills and different stuff like that. There yeah. was heaps of water tanks around. Yeah. Um, water tanks, yeah, and because, yeah, the valleys, heaps of rivers, mm-hmm. so heaps of underpasses, heaps of little bridges with a couple You've of You've got to get walls. creative. Yeah, yeah. We had coalies and, you know, a few people hit the coalies. Like Voda was definitely one of the most pro- prolific writers in Tassie back in the day that really bombed a lot of different then stuff. Then he came to Melbourne. Yeah, and then he came to Melbourne. Um, and there was a couple crews that were really going hard in the early 2000s, BWF crew, and that was like Skur, Here, uh, Detour. Um, they were from the Eastern Shore. And those guys were like, they were like the crew that were driving, you know what I mean? They'd go drive and hit the highway spots and and do things like that where most of us were just meeting up and going to one spot. Like BWF were really fucking, they would dominate in the early 2000s. You could, like Detour at one point was just up everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, so that was kind of mainly it was, yeah. Detour was one of the first guys I saw that, I was like, oh, you can put your paint in the car and just go anywhere anywhere. all night, you know what I mean? And with it, with yeah. the with like a with how we would consider like a track side, was there like the bus routes? You know, people would see more of this spot if you're going down the bus route. Yeah, Is definitely. That, yeah, 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 stuff like that. There are some old, tra- you know, there's still train tracks in tracks Tassie, so yeah. there was a lot of track side spots what? like that. But, but people um, commuters aren't seeing them though. That's a funny no. one. Yeah, yeah. Your best your best spots were like highway spots, spots. to yeah. get that attention or. Rooftops, yeah. you know, Tassie, Hobart's not a very big city. No. The rooftops aren't that high, you know what I mean? So if you could nail a good rooftop in the middle of the city, that yeah. was primo. And get away with it because someone's like, oh, I know you because yeah. it's not a big city. That's yeah, we used mind. to have heaps of graph heroes, man. Like <laughs> really? they used to get chased heaps. Like, hey, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, I know the they, guy that yeah, owns yeah. that joint. They run from like four blocks away. I'm like, I'm not even tagging your house, man. Like, you know what I mean? But yeah, we used to have heaps of that shit. It's gone now. What about acquiring supplies there? Because there's yeah. no, there's no big. Uh, well, you probably got hardware stores, but there's no Bunnings and shit like that. Yeah, so we had Mod Ten yeah. and Clance. Um, so yeah, I used to rack pretty hard. I did <laughs> yeah. a good trick. What I do? I was going, I'd go into Mod Ten. I'd go to the back and I'd get a, um, I buy some wood for like a fucking dollar or something like that, yeah. and put it in a box, and then um, go to the paint section, stash the wood under the shelf fill the box with cans 
And then I walk up to the counter and just go, oh, I've got a receipt, got some wood from the back. And they're like, you're right, mate, walk out, you know. So it's a good one. Yeah, we had this other shop, Chicken Feed, and that was like the Tassie $2 um, store that had its own theme song, like Chicken Feed is all you need because a little goes a long, long way. <laughs> and they sold export, you know. So like, yeah, yeah that, was, that was good days to go in and, I'd, you know, three in the front, two in the back. And, yeah. Um, Chicken feed. It's yeah, like the region shop sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, it's it's been it's gone now. It's it's a tragedy, really. Chicken you could get feed. Devon from there, bro. It was <laughs> like, it was happening, man. Like you get Devon, you get frozen pizzas. It was good. Yeah. But yeah, that region. And now we've got this other thing called shiploads. Oh. Yeah, shiploads. They yeah. kind of took over the reject shop spot. Shiploads. Yeah, shiploads. Man, I'm learning stuff. Yeah, I've been to Tassie yeah. a couple of times, but yeah, I never really delved into the uh, the retail situation. Yeah. It's different stuff. I know that they don't have 7-Elevens, which is something no. interesting. No, yeah. we um, yeah, no 7-Elevens. We didn't have – like I only had a few TV channels growing up. Yeah. Um, it was all run by the Tasmanian government, so there was still heaps of like um, Church of Latter-day Saints ads, uh, heaps of like – because, yeah, Tassie was pretty much – the government is so deep in with the church, you know what I mean? And yeah. it was really fucking weird propaganda. Yeah, and, you know, just like Tasmanian carpet cleaning, a top job every time, you know, like just random jingles like that. And yeah, they're really trying to indoctrinate you into loving Tassie and not going anywhere. Yeah, they did, man. Yeah. yeah. And is it – I remember someone I knew said that the, the Simpsons wasn't on much in, in Tassie. Like they're just not something they grew up with, which is so weird. He, Interesting. He had it on a lot, man. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Was... Interesting. Yeah, I, I don't remember too – yeah, I don't remember much of the Simpsons on on the old four channels, you know. Yeah. Um, no. Um, I'm getting sidetracked. You're right, I'm right. just I love the the how geographically close we are to Tassie, but it is so it fucking is, different. Yeah, it very is so different, different, man. Um, let's get back onto your journey. So, eventually, you find your crew. You're doing your hip hop thing, but mm. it, you, you inevitably come to Melbourne to to yeah, well, see what it's about. It was battle rap that I first like because I was making a bit of music and I was painting and I was living in a share house with a bunch of hip hop heads and we we're just getting drunk and. Tagging the walls and you know what I mean, and yeah. just living that rap bag hip hop life. And then I started doing more gigs. I remember when I, I think I was about 18, I supported the Obese Block Party down there, which you would know, have been huge, which was huge, man. I was, I was stoked, you know. And I uh, met legends like Bias B and Bigfoot, and you know, um, that was all such a blessing. But yeah, I was obsessed with rap battles, mm -hmm. and so I started organizing acapella rap battles and it was some of the first in the country it'd been done a little bit but i was watching it happening in america and the uk i've watched the world rap championships in 2006 and 2007 mm -hmm. and just once again that neurodivergence obsession you know and i went battle rap battle rap and then i just started going to the freestyle battles i went hard i wouldn't drink i just like drink water i case everyone out i just have just building bars in my head for the battle i just took it that seriously and um yeah by the end of 2009, I got, I think it was the early Facebook days, I got hit up by a guy that um, asked me to do, if I wanted to do a battle in Melbourne at the first Got Beef event, which mm. was March 20th, 2010. You remember it to the day. Yeah, bro. Yeah. Because yeah. my life changed, man. All of a yeah. sudden, I was in a room with like Thesaurus and Madness from America and they were, you know, Thesaurus was a two-time world rap champion. Mm -hmm. 360 was there. This is where I met Cursor. Uh, Purpose was there, Dirtbag Dan from America too. There was all of a sudden I'm like, how the fuck? I, I did it. I'm here. My heroes are here, you know. Yep. And I was so excited. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, with the – look, just to people that don't really get the whole rap battle sort mm. of thing, obviously you've got your battles with the instrumentals, but the acapella thing, it makes sense because it gives – the crowd time to react, I mm, believe. Yeah. Because if you're just – because then they can do the, oh, shit, or laugh yeah, yeah, or yeah. boo or whatever. So that kind of really does open it up. Like just doing the the battling to the instrumental, it doesn't leave enough time. Or you can use those points, I guess, to keep thinking on your feet. Is that mm, how yeah, it works? Yeah, yeah. I did – I actually battled someone on a beat the other night. In, How'd uh, you go? I, I smashed him. Yeah, yeah, it was good. But like – and it was fun because like – after all my years of experience, um, I see, like, because the beat, you do get that little catchback. 
Like, you, you know, the setup never matters. It's the punchline. Like, I battled a guy the other night in Thornbury. He was wearing a flanny. He had long blonde hair, skinny jeans. Right. So I was like, all right, I'll spit. You sure you're in Thornbury? Yes, you were definitely in Thornbury. I was definitely in Thornbury. I was <laughs> like, all right, I'll spit a dope verse. Why the fuck am I battling Kurt Cobain from Coburg? You know, and <laughs> yeah, like, and then the crowd lost it. Yeah. And I still got that time. And then you come back with, like, you can just fit a little setup and then punch. That's what I was battling for me. It's just like, set up, punch, punch set, set up, up punch, punch, set up. Like, yeah. And you just want to keep. Hitting them with those big, you know, roundhouses that get the whole crowd losing it. And there's a lot to similarities, obviously, <laughs> with the punchline, mm. obviously, but with uh, stand up comedy, mm. because you want people to almost be like, where is he going with yeah. this? I don't know where this is going. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. So that builds the tension even more. 100%. Yeah, I love it. Love. It's very interesting doing stand up now um, and also having the experience because it is it's punchlines. But yeah, it, when, I, when I'm battling, I just literally want to punch, 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 punch. But where I'm, um, when I'm doing stand up, I'll like set up and then go, punch. Bang. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and then you, you know, especially when you're doing, like I've been doing like an hour to an hour and a half of stand up. And so for me, it's like set up, set up, set up. Ew, punch, 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 punch. You know, and there are three different jokes that I can weave in between or chuck another setup in the middle of the build up to the next punch. It's really, it's fun. And the more that you get to do it, because I don't really write much stand up, yeah. I, um, I just tell stories and then find out funny punchlines because all my stand up's pretty much real stories. Yep. Some I'll exaggerate it for the sake of the punch, you know, like. Yeah. Like I met a distant cousin in Darwin. That really happened. And, you know, the punchline is like, so I've been fucking for a month and it didn't work out. You know, like yeah. that's obviously not true. But no. um, It plays on the Tassie it, persona. <laughs> exactly. And it's based off a real story, story. you know. Yeah. So like for me, my stand-up is just taking real stories and then finding that punchline to set it up and then mixing my real stories together and just litter the punchlines and the way it connects and calls back through it. Through. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's got to – yeah, this, the stand-up thing is a different beast, but I guess doing the uh, the rap battling, that it, you've you've got your head around how to set up and knock them down. Mm, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, so the start of that sort of thing, you're doing that in Tassie and then you come to Melbourne to do that, you're mentioning names like – Cursor and 360 and those guys who obviously went on to do big things, but that's mm. when you're starting to realise, fuck, I'm here in the mainland, yeah. I'm doing stuff, and then you think I can actually make a, make a real go of this. Yeah, that's it, man. Well, I've been making music for a couple of years and doing gigs, you know, supporting the Obese Block Party. Uh, doing, yeah. yeah, yeah, but I hadn't been invited to Melbourne. Yep. But once I did the, you know, the battles got me to Melbourne, mm -hmm. I was just sold on battle rap. I'm like, well, this is what got me here, this is what I'm going to keep doing, and yep. then... It was March, um, March in Melbourne, and then by the end of April, I was in Brisbane battling, and then by the end of May, I was back in Adelaide battling, yeah. and then by yeah, I just literally just went boom, 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 boom. Each event, I'd meet someone, I'd make a connection. Oh, you're from Brisbane, bro. I'll come up there, crash on your couch. Yeah, no worries. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. yeah, so that in 2010, I managed to do 10 battles around the whole country. It's awesome. And built it up to where I battled 360 at the end of 2010 in December. Yeah. And that's really what, like, got my name out to Australian hip-hop was, mm. you know. And shout-out 360, bro. i got nothing but love for you, man, because that changed my life, bro. You know yeah. what I mean? And he was an established industry artist at that point. I was just a rap bag from Tasmania that was obsessed with battle rap, you know. Yeah. and but But battling him gave me this kind of... People took me seriously. All of a sudden they put me on his level, you know, yeah. and yeah. A lot of people, especially the younger kids, probably don't really remember or know no. 60 for that because they only know him from his commercial success, which right. was extremely popular. Yeah. But he was out there competing overseas, doing a lot of battle rap stuff in the yeah. early days before he recorded much music at all. Oh, man, yeah. Him and Anecdote battled in New York 2007 at the yeah. WRC. The Mortal Technique was there, you know, like yeah. – 
It's um, crazy. My uncle, who has no idea about hip hop, rang me up one day. He's like, do you know this guy 360? He was just on the SEN Sports Channel talking about some sort of rapping sport thing. And I'm like, what the fuck? I knew <laughs> at that stage, I'm like, this has gone pretty commercial. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it, I mean, he, he did it. it the, 60 was definitely the first individual commercial successful hip hop artist. I mean, yeah. You know, the other guys are all groups, Hilltops, Bliss and Esso, you know. Yeah. But 60 really took it to that level, man. Yeah, and it's he's back touring again. He's doing Yeah, it's so good to see him back, man. It yeah. really, I really appreciate the energy he's putting out to the world. And you can tell he's done a lot of self-work as yeah. I've been on my own self-work journey. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd love to battle 360 again, but as Matthew and Andrew, <laughs> not as 360 and Greeley. Because when we all grew up in that young era, we're all just trying to prove ourselves. We're wearing this mask. We're all trying to do all this sort of stuff. Yeah. But I'd love to to have a rematch with him on some real shit, man. Like not to not to destroy Matthew, no. but just to like just cap it, cap the journeys, man. Because I love saying at the end of the day, we all got into this shit because we're all a bit neurodivergent. We're all we're all the misfits of certain worlds, mm-hmm. and we found something that led us to our tribe. But unfortunately, the negative side of hip hop can take over, and those masks, the ego, every aspect of it, you know. To- yeah, totally. He he um did post on social media a couple of weeks back that potentially he was thinking about battling yeah. again. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, man. No, I, I know he's. I know he's been. He's. He's. Yeah. You know, we'll yeah. see. We'll yeah. see. You know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not putting any expectations out there, but I'm excited to see what happens. A lot of. A lot of that old generation, I spend a lot of time talking to Jay Legend. Shout out Jay. He's from um, Brisbane and he absolutely killed it. And he came to the event last year where Dundee and I had our rematch after 13 years. And yeah, we'll see, man. After this, you know, we're putting on this uh, Break and Bread event uh, mm-hmm. with my mate T. That's April 6. Yep. And, you know, there was a lot of battle rap that happened last year. I battled Thesaurus. Um, which is fucking crazy. I can't believe last year I battled Dundee and Thesaurus. Unfortunately, that battle hasn't been released due to some other shit that's been going on. But You can't it's... talk about it. Oh, I can talk about it. Unfortunately, the promoter fucked up. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and yeah. I'm not sure exactly what's happening with the footage, but yeah. hopefully it comes out soon. Yeah, I'm sure you battled uh, Dundee plenty of times, just not recorded yeah, yeah, and we, with beers we, around. Yeah, we <laughs> battled fucking thousands, <laughs> man. Yeah. But... um. Yeah, so I'm excited. I think this Break and Bread Productions event, like I've been doing a bit with these guys and, you know, we've organised a rap battle event. We've got a few interstate rappers coming down. We've got a really good headline with Eric Devine versus Eros. I'm going to be battling a stand-up comedian, uh, Howie Farmer from Darwin. The and Vietnamese. So, yeah, the Vietnamese yeah, fellow, like, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he's a unit, bro. Like I met him... Like, cause he's huge, bro. He had like a hundred k on Instagram, mm. and I rocked up to this random pub in the middle of Darwin. There's no one there. This like dingy stand-up comedy night, and I looked. I was like, "How are you?" And he's like, "Do you know who I am?" <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, brother." <laughs> like, and we hit it off from there. Yeah. And we did a bunch of stand-up together. Uh, he loves hip hop. He really loves rap, like properly. Yeah. And so, as a comedian, you know, a big part of his jokes are kind of based on being a Vietnamese guy that loves rap. Mm-hmm. So we'll have fun, man, and hopefully. Hopefully we can bring it back in a fun way yeah. because one thing with Battle Rap, it definitely, came, you know, the toxic side of it just got too, got too introverted. It got too niche. Like a lot of the guys that got into Battle Rap in the last few years compared to 15 years ago were guys that don't make much hip-hop music. Yeah. They were kind of more straight into Battle Rap. And unfortunately I think the scene niched out a bit. It got too, you know, in kind of like, you know, Tassie, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, but it, but it was kind of like it's once everything is just too in house and you're only talking about what this guy said at this battle last week and this and that, the yeah. audience is like, I haven't been watching seven seasons of this, you yeah. know, and so what I, my intention of um, working with Break and Bread Productions, because they're doing so much good shit in the, the hip hop scene in Melbourne with music, with break dancers, with DJs, they're bringing back the culture. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that we can take what battle rap was in Australia, combine it with this and make it a bit more hip hop again. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah, for sure. Because it did go on its own sort of thing. It did, man. After the 360 and Cursor battled and they both their music was going crazy, you know, it wasn't viable for them to be battling. No. You know, it's not a smart idea for their careers. And um you it know, was, and the feel, shame. The shame. Sorry. No, you're right. 
but that was almost the pinnacle of battle rap in Australia, but it also was the sort of kind of like the summit of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it kind of – it had a good few years yes. after that and then um, when Mike Pipes and Barry Bonza came through, you know, shout-outs to Wizard of Oz. He's always done so well with Real Talk. But, man, there was so much bullshit, you know. Like, to be honest, there was just – it was just ego. You know, like I saw Wizard of Oz last year and we hugged, man. It was great. But, you know, him and I definitely got caught in – bit of button heads over territorial battle shit and it, yeah it's very interesting it's so beautiful to get to this age on this journey and just let go of all that and reconnect with these people as mm -hmm. just humans you know but that's the thing that as a, someone who doesn't do that stuff i watch i'm like okay so where do you draw the line like obviously people do their research they're talking about like you go, you want to make this guy look like a fuckhead but then people do talk about their partners and stuff and that's not really cool but it mm. does get done like it's, it gets to a really fucking grey kind of murky area. It does, man. But this is where I want to take the sense of battling and bring it back to a bit more of a roasting. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like there's a, there's a way to battle people where you're not hurting their feelings, you know. Yeah. And, um, and that's, like, uh, that's the toxic side of it. Like I think that's where it got separate because a lot of the hip-hop scene – doesn't just want to see people's souls get destroyed. Yeah. But then once this culture kept getting built up and it got a bit of attention and then people had egos because of the attention and it's a small community too. So you had like, you know, I'd be bat like, I'd battle people and then we'd get fucked up after the show. We'd all talk about our problems and then the next battle event, everyone's burning each other for the problems that we shared at the yeah. last one. And it was just like, what is this? That's not cool. It wasn't cool, man. No. You know. It's it's probably in 2024 when everybody's so worried about everyone else's feelings and mm. being politically correct. Mm. It's a it's a hard thing to go out there and just roast people, you know. Yeah, oh, there's a, there's a way to do comedy. it. Though. Yeah, but there's a way to do it, man. Like I found this. I spent the first years doing stand up. What can I can and can't say? You yeah. just got to say what you say. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's all about owning it. I think mm -hmm. if you say something half hearted because you're worried that people are going to get offended, uh, then they're going to get offended because you're being half hearted about it. Yeah. Like if you watch Kill Tony, you'll see some guys come out and say the most reckless, unpolitically correct shit, but it's their stick. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. And I think that's where there's a healthy balance. Like, for sure. you know, like homophobia, for example. Like, even last year when I was hosting these freestyle battles around the country, there was still people just being like, oh, you're gay. Oh, no, nah, you're gay. Oh. And so I get up on the stage and I'm like, all right, lads, fucking every time there is a gay joke said tonight, by the end of the night, I'm going to suck a dick. <laughs> I'm going to fucking suck one of you lads' dicks at, by the fucking front door. Yeah. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. I'm not getting cancelled because you're uncomfortable with your sexuality. You know what I mean? And just yeah. talking shit. But the, saying that on stage broke the tension in the room. Yeah. And, you know, some of the lads were losing it. Some of them were really triggered. The homophobic lads were like, oh, no, nah, bros, why you can't say that? And I'm like, well, yeah. say what I fucking want. <laughs> you know? And that's it. Like, I mean, uh, Fitzroy, which mm. is a very politically place, correct yeah. place, on stage yelling at a bunch of lads from the street that I'll suck their dick <laughs> for being yeah. homophobic. But that, you know, like, but that sort of stuff is the lowest hanging fruit, though, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You're a homo, or you know, yeah, yeah. Your, your, your mum's a slut. Like it's just. I, I saw boring. one. I saw one battle, bro. And it was like one guy was like, "Yeah, you're gay." And the other one was like, "Nah, you're gay." And the other one was like, "Nah, you're gay." And that's all the battle was. And at the end, they were like hugged and they're like, "We're actually real good friends." And I'm like, "Nah, I'm pretty sure you're gay." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's and it. that's okay. Yeah. It's all right, fellas. Just admit it. Just take it. <laughs> but aside from where it's going, and hopefully it's going into a place where people can roast each other in a the whole. Now that I think about it, the battle rapping it was wasn't always about who was the shittest cunt. It was like who could flex their skills, Yeah. right? So it's not about making the other person look stupid. It's about you looking better than them exactly. and that's where it needs to get to again. Exactly. The focus needs to be rather than attacking someone, someone. making sure you're funny, that you, you're dope, yeah. you're that you're going to have funny punchlines, right. you know. So and that's what it becomes hyper-focused where people just hyper-focus on destroying the other person. person. And, yeah. yeah, that happened to me in a few battles. Yeah. Like where I just walked away from it with a bad taste in my mouth. And I was like, that cunt was my friend, I thought. You know, like, and just, yeah. what are we doing this for? And then you don't even know, because like you said, you might be hanging out with them, having a beer. They're just building ammo on you, yeah. finding out your personal stuff. Yeah. And that's fucking not really. 
Yeah, it got, it, it, it's forced me to be a transparent person, though. I, I'm grateful for my whole experience because, one, I got to deal with a lot of my childhood insecurities through being yelled at <laughs> about them in front mm. of hundreds of people, watch them on the internet. It definitely made some insecurities worse and fucked with my mind in certain ways, you know, but yeah. I got to process that. It helped build me up and, um, yeah, in hindsight, it made me very analytical as well. Have you seen it come to like physical blows? Have people lost it before and then they actually start physically fighting? Yeah, I've, I've seen a couple little moments. I've nearly had a couple moments myself, yeah. you know, where once again there were heaps of drugs around. Like I battled one fellow who was off his head on meth and he was just looking for a reason to fucking get in my face, you know, and yeah. said something that he didn't agree with and uh, nothing happened of it though. Yeah. You know, Cursor and Zoned Out had a little standoff at the first golf beef and that was fucking notorious for years. People still ask me about it. Mm. Um, but nothing too dramatic, bro, really. Yeah. More more drama on the internet and drama about people saying they're going to run through events or this and that. There was a lot of that shit. Yeah. Nah, didn't really happen too much. There is a lot of toxic masculinity that's associated with that sort of stuff, mm. though, for sure. Yeah. No, there definitely is, man. And, um, yeah, this my intention really, especially with the way that I'm connecting with this current hip-hop scene in Melbourne, is to really bring this event and, you know, working with Breaking Bread Productions to a really positive, fun level. Like, yeah. there's going to be dancers uh, coming to the event. They're going to be dancing in between the battles. Uh, we've got DJ Mishap. She's, like, she's one of yeah. the dopest hip-hop DJs in Australia at from the moment. Perth, yeah. yeah, she's from Perth, and yeah. she's out here in Melbourne absolutely killing it. Mm -hmm. She's going to be holding down on the ones and twos. Yep. So um, is it a cappella, or is it gonna, you're going to have... Yeah, there'll be a cappella battles. Battles, yeah. And... Um, We've got Shine and Armour hosting it. We're gonna we're gonna G it up. It's gonna be a bit UFC. We're gonna have you know a weigh-in event just before um, the battle event where we're gonna have a bit of stand-up comedy and yeah, nice. and we're just gonna we're just really trying to build the culture back in a positive way, be inclusive to everyone. Because that's it. Once again, battle rap. Once it got too toxic, it just wasn't inclusive. Mm. But for me, hip hop is inclusive, and that's got to be first and foremost. It doesn't matter who you are. Uh, yeah, you know for sure. And I think it some stage hip hop lost its way with its anger and exclusivity, which mm. is what total opposite of what it was supposed to be in its yeah, original man. inception, you know? It is, man. But once again, that's a butterfly effect from the fucking industry. Like, mm. you know, and I mean, yeah, I think, I think that a lot of the music that was projected to this side of the world, like we had access to good hip hop, but you know, fuck, they put some pretty heavy gangster shit and I think that came with its own agenda, you know. Like, mm. I, I don't think that, um, you know, for example, America banned Queen for dressing in drag in a video clip from even coming to the country. At the same time, they were sending fuck the police out to the rest of the world, mm. which uh, is still having its own effect today, you know, in different ways of, I don't know, how it, like, what I realised, especially with the battle rap scene that I grew up in, a lot of people that... A neurodivergent, a lot of people that come from different backgrounds, some rough, some not, you know what I mean? And But everyone's there trying to fucking prove themselves and trying to climb this sort of ladder to get this attention. Yeah. And um, that's where, yeah, it did get toxic. Like I've, I've talked with other mates that, and now it's like looking back on 12 years ago, I didn't realise he f was feeling uncomfortable in the room. You know, but in the event that I put on last year with Dundee, he came down to it and he's like, man, this is great. This makes me want to do battle rap again because I'm in a healthy environment. Mm -hmm. There's no fear or anxiety around the toxic staunch side. And yeah. yeah, so that's really the main intention is that with Break and Bread Battles, we want to um, bring back the fun of battle rap in an acapella format because on beats are usually a lot more fun. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of got the music to go with it. But if we can really hype it up, you know, all the all the artists that are going to be battling um, all have a good rapport with each other, you know. And I know sometimes people, oh, they need to have beef, you know what I mean? But, like, let's just be honest. Yeah. Like, we're going to have a good time. We're going to laugh. It's we're going to roast each other. It's yeah. theatre. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And 
it's hip hop first yeah. and foremost. That's like, it. Yeah, man. Mm. I think the way you said bring the UFC kind of vibe to it. That's a great way to look. Yeah, at it. exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Dundee. I know he's a good mate of yours. Do you yeah, want man. to touch on uh, your relationship with him or how you met him? And and obviously you guys uh, have Dunno's. done a lot of shit together. Yeah, man. Dunnas and I've man, we've been through so much together. You know, he really he's been there through for me through so many different situations in life, especially when I went to prison. Dundee. He was he held me down. Mm-hmm. And um yeah, I first met him when I was a kid. His dad owned a local pub in, in Hobart. It was called the Republic. It's pretty notorious. Still there. It's still there. Top of the hill there. He, he doesn't own it anymore. Oh, yeah. yeah, he sold it off. But you know, they're still holding down a lot of uh local hip hop gigs. We did the THC Apple Isle style album launch there only a few months ago. Yep. Which was really They do good. a lot of live music still there. Yeah, they do. They yeah. do. They're still definitely one of the best venues, even though it's not owned by Dunner's dad. <laughs> but shout out Carl, the manager. But um, yeah, man, me and Dundee, fuck, we've had a journey together, bro. And we've like, we've grown in so many different ways together, individually. You know, we've lived different lives in certain ways. But we've always kind of been joined at the hip, you know. And um, regardless of if I'm there with him or I'm on the other side of the country or if he's in Canada or if he's in England and, you know, I love yeah. that I love that fella unconditionally, man. Yeah. Mm. And when a lot of guys think of Tassie Hip Hop, they think of you two guys. Yeah. Like you, you, yeah, you're a part and parcel. You're kind of a double act in that. Sense. Yeah, man. Well, that's kind of like, you know, because the thing is when I started doing the battles on the mainland – Dunners was living in Melbourne uh, in a hip-hop crew at the time trying to get into like the Fitzroy freestyle scene and doing gigs and stuff, but he wasn't really getting anywhere with that. And so I was like, bro, come jump on the battle train because Dundee had been battling for years before I did in freestyle. His first a cappella battle was against me uh, in 2000. But you are already mates. Yeah, we, were, oh, we weren't close then. There was a right. little bit of tension back then. Right, okay. Like we knew each other. But he was in a crew with a guy that I didn't get along with when I grew up and I was like, I don't like your mate. So there was a little bit of a tension. Like that battle had a little bit of smoke in it. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. But Is it online? Yeah, uh, it's on Don't Flop actually. But Greeley vs Dundee, that was the first one. Would have been early 2010. So you were friends but not close. Yeah, yeah. local, like associates yeah, I guess. Associate, yeah. But that battle brought us closer together. And then I was living in Brisbane at the end of 2010. And I remember he came up and watched my battle against 360. He was in the crowd when I battled 360. Yeah. Which was a fucking life-changing moment once again. Yeah, because like, 360 is already kind of crossed over a little bit. of. Oh, yeah, yeah, massively. But it was just – it was – the manifestation it was crazy, man. Because I was a 17, 16 – living in Tassie, watching 360 do the World Rap Championships on YouTube. And then, and I manifested. I was like, I want to battle this guy. I was obsessed with it, you know. And all of a sudden, two years later, I'm on a stage in Brisbane in front of 500 people battling him. I felt like I had, was having a heart attack, bro. I was just like, it's happening. How the fuck? Did, I'd made it. I'm here. And like, you know what I mean? It was crazy. And I remember seeing Dunners in the crowd and he was like, and I was just like, what? <laughs> you know, like, it was hectic, bro. We never, especially coming from this small island, we just never thought we could yeah. do that, you know. And same deal, like, because of my um, criminal record, I wasn't able to go to Canada when I was offered to and things like that. And Dundee went and, you know, like, fuck, he lost his luggage in the airport yeah. and he was getting fucked around and he was having a bit of a panic attack over there and I was in Tassie just, like, on the phone to him, just holding him down, just keeping him calm, like, no, nah, you got this, bro, you're going to smash the battle tomorrow, you'll sort out the luggage, don't worry, brother. You know, we've had so many crazy moments where we've been there yeah. for each other and we've had our own ego moments, you know, where, really? like, yeah, because, you know, once again, like, fucking men trying to prove ourselves and this sort of stuff and mm. that's the interesting thing that you notice in this game and it really does affect the culture in a lot of ways when certain people get bigger than others and this and that you know mm. if you don't have a deeper understanding of each other shit can go pear-shaped i've watched it happen hundreds and hundreds of times between some of the closest friends over those sort of differences but yeah. you know i have so much faith that regardless of like the dunners where him and i are at we will always come back together when it's when it's right, you know. For sure. Mm. Man, and it's awesome to have somebody who gets not only what you're about but also where you're from as well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He gets all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, That whole Hobart connection. Yeah, it's definitely, man. pretty strong. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, Dundee is a big, you know, like when 
before I was doing gigs, Dunners was in a band called Unleash the Nugget, which was like his high school band. And they killed it. It was like a full kind of jazz band with two rappers and he won the Battle of the Bands and, you know, things like that. So Dunners was the man before I really was allowed in the pub. You know what I mean? And yeah. Um, so, yeah, I really looked up to him. Because he's a couple of years older. Yeah, he's a few years older than I am. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he was like, yeah, 19 in the pub, smashing shows, packed out. That was like the biggest local band. They had a big buzz going for a while. Yeah. And um, and I was outside the pub watching through the window. You know what I mean? And, yeah. yeah. Yeah, crazy, man. I remember, um, yeah, the day I turned 18 and they let me into the Republic <laughs> and his dad was like, all right, now you can fucking, you know what I mean? And, yeah. You just mentioned before about Dundee and he helped you out when you were going through tough times and like when you were incarcerated. Mm. Do you want to tell us about that and how that, I'm guessing that's what sort of tipped off your journey of enlightenment for lack of a better term. Is that right? Yeah, it definitely was. I think, um, yeah, first kind of really, well, yeah, I think due to the trauma I had when I was young, uh, you know, I saw a lot of violence, different stuff like that, and that became a part of my learnt behaviour. And, yeah, there was quite a lot of times where I was violent in my teenage years, in my in my 20s, and that resulted eventually uh, in a situation where I broke someone's jaw. And, um, yeah, so I ended up in prison. And, yeah, when I was in jail, I, I read, you know, I read the book uh, The 12 Steps to Life, The Antidote, the Chaos by Jordan Peterson. And it was the first time that I heard someone break down and explain scripture um, from a scientific point of view. You know yeah. what I mean? And, yeah. and I was like, oh, I get it now because of the trauma that I went through growing up and there was a lot to do with the church and different stuff like that. I rejected all of that stuff. But when you're in jail and, and you're, um, you know, you're freaking out about different like fucking, I was worried about my sisters. I was worried about sit situations. I just learnt to pray because that was the only way that I could get through that moment of being locked in a cell and being, you know, holding fear for what was happening outside of the jail that I couldn't control, you know. Mm. And um, so that's what I, I, I started to pray. But And then I read this book and it broke down scripture. And I was like, okay. And then I ended up going to prison church. And in the church in prison, shout outs to the priest. He was a sick, absolute legend, you know, absolute weapon. And now I look back on it with my understanding of God now is that you go to the prison church and all the fellas would try and just fucking argue with him and try and be like, what about this? What about that? And this guy, didn't matter what they'd say, he'd like, he was like a BJJ master and he'd just grapple him and make him tap but with love, you know what I mean? And he'd go, no, nah, it's like this, boom. And I was just so impressed at how he could take the negative energy these guys were throwing him and he'd flip it back and give it back to him with love. Because mm -hmm. as well, I was trying to talk to a lot of fellas, you know, because when I went in, I was like, oh, I need to make this. I felt a lot of shame. I felt guilt, you know. I fucking made a big mistake. And a lot of people knew about it. The newspaper in Tassie was putting it out there and... A lot of people, there's a lot of people that don't have a positive opinion of me, you know, mm. and due to behaviour that I've displayed in the past. And so when I was going in, I was like, yeah, I need to make this a positive thing. And I was trying to like talk to certain fellas about changing their lives around. Uh, I helped a guy called Kane and um, he's changed his life around massively and he's been out now five years and we met inside. And But then there were other guys that were like, fuck off, Goose, I don't want to listen to you, you know. So mm. when I saw this priest in prison just being able to like use the logic of scripture and his understanding of God to to give these fellas love didn't matter what they threw at him I was so impressed and then it's like it's almost battle rap in a different he's it like, was he's yeah. like I'm taking what you're saying I'm going to put it back on you and figure it out and disarm you exactly yeah and it yeah. was he just disarmed them every time they couldn't be couldn't maintain the the staunch attitude and um yeah, and then I had one day in prison where I just woke up and I realised, I was like, if we all fucking actually love ourselves and put ourselves first, we, oh, we're not going to be here. But it was like overwhelming, you know what I mean? And right. I ran into Kane's you and I was like, Kane, 
bro, we just got to love ourselves. And he's like, you fucking right, mate. And I was like, nah, bro, this is what we got to do, you know. And, um, yeah, that was another big awakening. But, yeah, after I got out, I kind of leaned right back from the idea of God. And, you know, I was, I was out. I was out. Ah, back in the world. Anymore, I don't yeah. need this anymore. Blah, blah, blah. Exactly. Mm. And, um, yeah, so, yeah. You then so you sort of slipped into bad habits or you just you just would just sort of put your spiritual journey on hold a little bit? Yeah, it just kind of went on hold, mm-hmm. you know. I wasn't – well, like when I got out, I had my album to record. Um, my mate Complete was doing a tour. I hit yeah. him up. I jumped on the tour. You know, I went to Perth and recorded my album. I ended up getting stuck in Brisbane on the Complete tour because Corona came in, you know. Yeah. I got out just before this – like I remember when I got out – Everyone in Australia was like, it's coming. And I was just like, man, I've just been in jail for a year. If I could bring on the lockdown, yeah, you know, yeah, I've got yeah. Netflix and weed, I'm good. <laughs> but, um, yeah, uh, yeah, it just went on hold. And, like, um, and then uh, I was in a relationship with an artist uh, by the name of Denny, and she's Indigenous, uh, Palawa Mob from Tassie. And her and I made a lot of music together and we travelled the country together. And... Um, yeah, I learned so much on our journey from people we connected with. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time with her cousin and her mob uh, in Luchawida, which is a traditional name for Tassie. And, yeah, my understanding the connection of spirit that mob have with the universe around them, with the country, um, with the weather, mm-hmm. with everything... I saw it. I started to see it more and more and more and more. Mm-hmm. And uh, the more I learned and I listened and honoured, which was my main kind of intention is to honour. And I think, I think a big problem in Australia is the lack of honour. Like if you look at all war um, through time and history, a big part of, like, war was honour. And if we look at the war in the history of Australia, no honour, you know? Yeah. Like, people, if you defeat someone in war, you honour them, you know? Like, it's quite common that you'll see, you look through history, even shit like, you know, someone would keep the head of the, tri- the tribe that they like defeated. Trophy, yeah. No, but no, not as so much a trophy, but as honour. Oh, you know okay. what I mean? Yep, it's yeah, like yeah. he was a great fight. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so in my regards to understanding and learning about everything that this country is, that was and what it's become now, I try to come from an uh, intention of honour, you know? And that's, yeah, that's kind of like where things started to become more obvious to me and and bit by bit by bit by bit, layer by layer, um, I understood more and more and it, it really led to a deeper spiritual connection within myself, within the world around me and then eventually back to God. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I can... You know, it's the, the hard thing is with religion, um, spirituality, all these sorts of things, there is so many different, all across the world, there's so many different cultures, there's different beliefs, there's different techniques, there's different practices, there's, you know. But as I went on my journey and I shared and I learnt and just, you know, and when I learn, I, I learn, you know, I really, yeah. if if I believe, you know, and if someone is sharing with me their authentic experience, Rather than doubt it, I listen and try and understand and it has, you know, it becomes a part of who I am, mm. you know, and yeah. That's with, with that sort of stuff when you listen to someone else's beliefs, it's it's cool because you don't have to necessarily take all of that on board but you can take a little bit of that on board. Yeah, you can yeah. just understand a little bit and that can help you in your own personal journey. It sounds like what you were doing a fair bit. Definitely. Speak to these, everybody who might be, interested in this religion, that religion, you just learn a little bit from them and you can take some of that or all of it on board. A hundred percent. And I think um, for me what really like kicked it off on the next level, uh, Denny and I went our separate ways and I realised that I was still carrying 
all sorts of different trauma throughout my life. I didn't even really get a chance to heal from jail. You know what I mean? And that's a traumatic experience. You get cut off from your family and the world for a year and the shit that I witnessed in there too that come with a lot of trauma. Mm. Um, it sent me on a big journey to really get to the bottom of everything. So I, I pretty much recreated my life and my journey. Mm -hmm. I communicated with my dad in America and I communicated with my mum a lot and found out all the details in the early years of my life, especially like I was first, I was made an Australian citizen when I was two months old in New York and then they put me on a plane to Tasmania, you know, and that's fucking hectic for a two-month-old baby Crazy, yeah. to be travelling from New York to Tasmania, yeah. you know, and, um, and then, yeah, my parents split up when I was quite young uh, and they went their separate ways. My dad went back to America and... You know, they were both involved with the church, which came with its all its religious political ideas and all this sort of stuff. So I grew up with such a resentment for the church and Christianity and, and God mm. because at the time I was being told, oh, you know, everything's hap happened for a reason. God has sent your dad back to America. I was like, fuck God, you know, like mm. I want my dad. Yeah. But it's crazy because over the last year, while I've been on this journey, I've reconnected with my father to find out all these moments in my life that led me to be where I am and this is the thing when we go through traumas and we don't know about it because we're kids it's like a rock in the backpack you know what I mean and then because you've gone through this one you're more vulnerable you're going to end up in another situation where you're more likely to get trauma another rock in the backpack another rock another rock yeah. by the time I was 18 man I was carrying a heavy backpack yeah. of trauma and hate and pain you know fuck my dad fuck this fuck that everything you know yeah. And then that became the vehicle that made me an angry person that reflected the behaviour of, you know, violence in the world around me. So the stint in prison, reading that book, they're the catalyst to push you into this direction. But I'm guessing there's got to be some more that happens for those enlightening times. Mm. Like is there any therapy or, or anything that happens for you to just come to these realisations or is that something that you just literally read, did some self-reflection mm. and came to those terms? Well, all the, the stuff I've learned about trauma comes from my journey and travelling. Like uh, Fatty Few, who's from Geelong, he's a drug and alcohol counsellor and he's been my friend for a long time and it was probably like... It was before I went to prison, he sat me down one night and he drew out a diagram of the brain and he showed me how trauma affects it. And, you know, and I learned a lot from him. And then, so I already kind of like had a fair idea of trauma. And I'm, I've always been the person that can give advice to people but struggle to do it myself, mm. you know. And um, so in the last year after, yeah, Denny and I went our separate ways, I was just like, no, nah, I need to do this. I need to do it not only for myself, for my family and the world around me. Yep. And, you know, and just I realised like I was getting angry again. I was like, you know, I, and, and I had this one moment. I was like, I am not going back. Like I can't, I'm not going back to jail. Mm. Like, there's no way I can put myself in a situation where I'm going to lose my temper and do something that I regret and then back up in there. I was like, no, nah, I'm yeah. not getting a second chance of going back to prison. Like everyone knew I went to that first time. I can't go back right. now. Yeah. You know what I mean? I need to do this self-work on a deep level. Yeah. Mm. And that, yeah, that's hectic, man, because like a lot of people say I've got an anger problem or I've got an anger management problem or whatever. Mm. But what you're talking about is let's get to the cause of those problems rather than trying to fix them. Mm. Let's get to the cause of them. Let's figure out why. Exactly. And then we can start to talk about fixing them. Because, man, half of the shit I was angry about, I'd suppressed. Mm. The trauma that I was actually angry about and reflecting in negativity on the world, I didn't even know that yep. was a seed. It wasn't until... I started to recreate my journey. You know, I went back to the church that my, my parents went to when they split up. Was that confronting though, like going back to... Yeah, it was. Yeah. And what I did, man, I FaceTimed my dad in America and I walked into the church in the middle of service and I reclaimed the space in, in his name and his spirit. And because my dad was rejected from this church and told to leave because he had a different spiritual belief compared to the Anglican Church of Australia. Yeah, wow. And, yeah, they labelled him a heathen and said, no, nah, you're out of here. And, you know, at that time as well, all the business owners that were employers 
all went to that church. So all of a sudden, my dad was cut off. Yeah, it was a sm- it was like a cult level, you know, sort yeah. of thing. And um, so you know, yeah, I went back to significant places where traumas happened. Um, I communicated a lot with my dad. I communicated a lot with my mum. Uh, you know, I opened up to her about stuff that I went through as a kid that I'd never talked to her about. Um, to help her understand me because at the same time I'd never told my mum shit that I went through mm-hmm. and so when I did, she's like, oh, that's just why you've been angry. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but when I went through those traumas, I was too young enough to explain what happened to me, you know, yeah. and so it was, yeah, and then the more that I put myself in these places, it unlocked memories that I'd suppressed and I was like, okay, and now knowing what I do about trauma, I can relive and reprocess those situations that happen in the past through understanding why people do what they do. Yeah. Mm. And it makes you more of a well-rounded human because you might see somebody who goes straight to do something violent, erratic, crazy, mm. and you go, that person's holding on to some trauma. I see, that's all I see it now, bro. Mm. Like now that I've done the work... I can I can see the vibrations in your skin. You know what I mean? It's it's crazy. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. The more I've, the more I kind of become spiritually aware as well. You can just you can see it. You can understand it. Like I see the shadow around someone that is carrying their pain. Yeah, I can see it. And from the incarceration point of view, if you're talking about spirituality and being having negative vibrations, that's a negative place. Oh, yeah. So those dudes that you did 12 months or whatever you said, right, those dudes Mm. that are in there, they're carrying that negativity, they're carrying trauma, they're potentially carrying trauma that their parents have been through and so on and so Mm. forth, and they have that negativity and negative vibes from the whole venue and potentially not getting out for any time soon. That's hard for them to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and that's just going to breed more negativity. It is. But at the same time, you have to go to the darkness to find the light. Mm. And it was, you know, and it was confronting as fuck. I was in prison with some fucking horrible people, you know. But I realised as well people are people and hurt people hurt people. So if these people are hurting people, it's because someone hurt them, yeah. you know. And the more I understood that, the more I found the light. And I, and I realised that once again, like regardless of the circumstances and what different people do, um... Yeah, it's a hard one. You know, it's a hard one to kind of like. I just learned to accept and not judge. Yeah, yeah. It's for the. I've spoken to a few people that have been locked up on this show, and a lot of them say that there may be some sort of avenues within prison to get you mental health help, but mm. no one takes up on them because, for one, it makes you look like a, a point of weakness. Mm. And two, that they just don't really want to help you in there. Mm. Do you think that that's a stigma that needs to change? Like, is that, or can oh, it change? Oh, definitely, definitely. Can it change though? It can. And this is where, like, us as men, we need to be more, we need to learn how to articulate our emotions. But and if it, you said that, no, sorry, but I'm just trying to get my head around that someone's not been in there. Mm. And I get that. But if you're in a prison cell with people, that are murderers or whatever, mm. and you're saying, we're going to need to articulate our emotions, they're like, mate, don't come at me with this fucking whimsical shit. Do you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, no, but there's ways to go around it. You yeah. know what I mean? I find like a good way to get someone comfortable to open up about their trauma is show them how comfortably you can talk about your trauma. You okay. know, so for example, if I'm sitting there with a murder, I'm not going to be like, excuse me, man, could you articulate your emotions? You know what I mean? <laughs> of course. Yeah. I'm going to tell them about, about times I regret this and, you know, regret that. And, yep. and I think once people realise that, it's safe for them to talk about those vulnerable moments because you're talking about it. Some people don't. And I think uh, like some people, this is what I find. When I start talking about something I've been through and I can see someone's been through the same stuff, I can see it come up. You know what I mean? It's like, Ugh, like in them. And sometimes I'll go Ugh, back down and sometimes they'll just go, oh, and I'll talk about it too, you know, and yeah. that's where you get that. That's where you can see them start to heal because yeah. those insecurities come out of them. Yeah, you for know. Sure. And when you get your insecurities out, you can not carry them as much. You know, and the more that we talk about our insecurities, and and that's it, trauma becomes an insecure thing. Yeah, mm. and it'd be it'd be great that the 
people could get to the point where they can talk about that stuff and there'd be more mental health help in prison. But I think it's it's a it's a it's a long stretch for that to happen. Oh, it is, man. And we just, you know, yeah. There's there's ways that it's a very interesting time because trauma is one of the most common things talked about at the moment, especially in our generation. Is these tools of language to understand ourselves have only been available recently. You know mm. what I mean? And have only evolved recently. Yeah. Um, but I think people from our generations are really starting to get to this point and they're like, because if, if you don't work on your trauma and you just bury it and bury it, bury it, it'll come out in other ways. Totally. Uh, it'll come out in physical fucking, you know, all sorts of different negative outweighs. Yeah. And you did your stint, you came out and then you're on the right track on your spiritual journey, but that is not what happens majority of the time, you know. You, no. Most people would get, would reoffend and get sort of stuck in that cycle. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's interesting because I, I I share with a lot, and you always have to choose how far you share in regards to talking about God because people are, once again have trauma from the church. I didn't want to hear about God five years ago either. You know what I mean? Like it's, but it wasn't till, and this is what they say is like you know once once you have to carry the cross and you realize how heavy it is, and for me my awakening came. Coincidentally, in my 33rd year, which was the same year that Jesus was crucified, um, my 33rd year was this journey where I felt like I was crucified and reborn. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and it, I just had to, I just had to stop doubting it. And I, I love, I, I love intelligence. I love knowledge, you know. And I know so much. I knew so much about religious knowledge. Mm. But I just always dismissed it as fucking airy fairy shit. You yeah. know what I mean? But I think as well, I'd been through enough in life that I could, and I, and you know, they say, you know, um, walk in the valley, you know, shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. And don't get me wrong, when I went into prison, I was scared, but I showed respect and I had love. And I know that love overcomes fear every time. Mm. So I learned that that scripture, yeah, I will fear no evil because i got love and I'll overcome fear with, you know, and just the more that I started to practice these things and I saw they work and I realised, wow, that scripture's true, that scripture's true, you know, and, yeah, it just kind of started coming together. It's So in that sort of spiritual realm and you go on your own spiritual journey aside from just the... God stuff for lack of a better term you go on your own journey and traveling and you learn yeah. a lot about yourself yeah. other than that as well well a big part of leading me up to what was like it was one week in Darwin where so many synchronicities happened in one week bro and on the final day of the week I ran into the guy whose jaw I broke really yeah man and he's from Cairns that's a full circle moment I broke his jaw in Tassie yeah wow and we ran into each other at a Barker show in the beer garden of Busted Town in the middle of Darwin. And the, the only reason that I was at that show was because a bunch of other things manifested and synchronised and all of a sudden I'm at this pub and there he is. And it was a big week of it, man. And, like, I saw him and we both just hugged. We didn't even say anything first, mm-hmm. you know. And I said, man, I'm sorry I broke your jaw. And he goes, well, man... To be honest, everything happens for a reason because I wouldn't have done this, this and this and this and this and I wouldn't be here now if you didn't break my jaw. And he goes, well, I'm sorry you went to jail. And I'm like, brother, if I didn't go to jail, yep. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And then I realised if I didn't go to jail, I wouldn't have had that moment of awakening that I did right then. And it was, and this is where I truly realised that everything happens for a fucking reason and that's God. You know, even when you, he got his jaw broken, I went to prison, we were both grateful for it. And that was, that was like God slapped me in the face and said, and because especially in that time I was struggling, I was carrying a lot of pain, but I was refusing to take it out and, I, you know, and and let that be a reflection of fucking aggressive and negative behaviour on the world around me. And the more that I refused and I was like, no, nah, unconditional love, acceptance and forgiveness for anything that comes my way all of a sudden I'd be put in a spot a few days later to have another big crazy synchronicity that was just like, oh, mm. you know, and I couldn't deny it, man. It like, 
So before this stage, you hadn't really properly accepted the the religious spiritual thing. You were just like. I, it's I'm, it's present, but it's not fully there. And then once these yeah. things start to happen, you're like, I can't deny this anymore. Yeah, exactly. And at that point, I still wasn't really. I wasn't saying, like, I was just saying the word God. You know, like at that point, I wouldn't have used the word Jesus Christ at all. You so know what greater, I mean? Greater, greater. Like, it's just yeah, God. Yeah. You know, and um, you know, universe things like that. But um, yeah, that was like where my real journey made me believe. And then I started learning more and more about what God is and scripture and every aspect of that. And more and more and more, like now I believe that, you know, God is all one and the Bible, there's some bullshit in that. But generally, it's, it's a compilation of what people have written down when they were experiencing these sort of moments, you know. And um, I think the, the Bible is like the story of the subconscious of man. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. if you look at all these stories, they're all different stories to understand ourselves and understand who we are. And when, then I realised that the Bible is also like the archetype for every fucking superhero movie ever. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's just – Every story has been told in the Bible pretty much. Exactly. And, yeah. and, you know, like every hero movie, it's about a hero – that becomes crucified at one point becomes a saviour. You know what I mean? Like most of Marvel are just man-made versions of what the Bible is. Mm. And then I was chilling with my mate and he goes, oh, true, like John Connor. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, like John Connor. And he's like, JC, JC. You know what I mean? And I was like, true. And then because he didn't quite believe in God and I said, well, I guess the idea of accepting Jesus Christ into your life is like becoming the John Connor of your own action movie, you know? And it's like when you allow, you know, I think there's like God and then there's, you know, Jesus is the son of God that delivers the spirit. I see it in the same way of like the universe and everything is God. The son, like Jesus the son, the son delivers son. the light. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I spend a lot of time like honouring the son and just straight like, just staring into the sun and just honouring everything. And every time I do, I can feel uh, the electricity inside me. I can feel my muscles. I can feel everything and it's just like, you know. Yeah, well, the sun is the, is the giver of life. Exactly. Of yeah. Like Jesus is the sun that delivered the spirit. You know what I mean? Like and yeah. this is where we get so caught up on the, the terms and conditions. conditions. Yeah. yeah, and oh, no, Jesus was this bloke, you know, but it's, it's all one. You know what I mean? It's, I, yeah. yeah, I knew you were on the spiritual thing, but I didn't know that you were so, – so are you, if you had to label it, are you labelling it like a Catholicism or what is no, it? No, I, do, I definitely think, once again, that the labels is where shit gets mixed up. You know, we should all be able to – we should all be able to um, share. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, if you're – you know, if you believe in God, then Jesus is the only one. And I believe that there are many – I believe there's – Good and dark religions, there's definitely elements of it all. Yeah. But um, unfortunately, I just love people too much and I believe that a good Muslim with faith in their heart is exactly right as I am. You know, it's... Uh, Essentially, at the end of the day, when you break it all down, and this is coming from someone who's basically an atheist, mm. They all, everyone believes in just a higher power. Mm. It's just a different sort of one. Yeah, it is, man. It's you all know? the same, all different languages for the same stuff. stuff. Yeah. But I've like, and the more I put my bare feet on the ground and really like in my mind, I'm like, thank you, God. And I can feel the ground charging me. And it's like my health has improved dramatically. Mm -hmm. I've lost heaps of weight. I haven't been to a gym. You know, like it's really, you know, I've, I like went over to Perth uh, to bit of beliefs wedding and I rocked in. Everyone was like, fucking. Look at you, mate. What do you want? I was like, fucking God. And they're like, all right. You know, but oh, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and that's the thing. Like, I've even in Tassie, like, fucking, mate, you've lost, you've lost so much weight. What's the answer? I'm like, God. And they're just like, yeah, each their own dickhead. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and it's just like, uh, because my experience has been so profound, I understand how silly that sounds. You know what I mean? But mm. uh, it's good, man. It's God good. is good, bro. And like, it's the truth, you know. And yeah. watching, watching someone like Spaniard, man, I, I really, I really am so proud and inspired by his journey, you know, and I did a podcast with him a couple of years ago and I've watched him build his shit 
Mm. And you can't deny that, like, you know, and it's the same. When I was in jail, one of my mates said to me, Jai, he goes, what's the deal with all these Christians, man? They actually do get fucking pretty good lives, eh? Like, mm. what's the deal? You know what I mean? But yeah. I've realised that, you know, God is the father. And if we allow God into our life, it's like having a father role in your own life that is going to push you forward in a way that's going to make you, if you hold yourself accountable to God, it's holding yourself accountable to the Father and the discipline of the Father and your life is only going to get better. Yeah. You know? At the end of the day, all that stuff just comes down to, I think I mentioned it before, just be a good person. That's exactly it, man. It's, yeah. it's you know, good and evil. With, like, yeah. I mean, if we, if we take an O out of good, it's God. If we put a D on evil, it's devil. You know, mm. it's the same shit. Like, it's... Mm. Crazy. Uh, with the Spaniard thing, man, like I was just watching his m- most recent one last night, the mm. Melton one. Yeah. I love what he does and I'm, it's interesting as fuck. Mm. But he's just become so big now that those things that he does, just it's not a genuine reflection of the area because no. he's just the ghetto Pied Piper with everyone following him, with everyone doing it. So yeah. I'm thinking now it'd be a great time for someone to go to those places a week after him mm. <laughs> without the fanfare and let's just see what it's actually like. That's because interesting, bro. those people are just turning it on a lot. I'm yeah, not yeah. saying that they're not hectic areas, yeah, but yeah. I'm sure that if you just went there at 3 o'clock on a normal day, there's not a million kids doing donuts. Yeah, yeah, exactly, man. You know, and he's got too big for his own sort of good in in that I respect. Mean, well, I think it's such a positive thing, bro, because he's empowering them. You know what I mean? And and a lot of those places. And the same when I did a gig in Bridgewater in Tasmania, um, we empowered him, and we had so many people going, "Why are you going to Bridgewater?" Oh, it's going to be fights, blah blah blah. And it was good. That was like they had a good night. You know. So I think. I mean, Spanion, from how I see him at this point in his journey, is just empowering people. And then on top of that, the more youth from the streets that watch him and then see that he's, one, sharing the word of God, two, telling people to not be violent, three, being a good example of living a healthy, clean life, exercising, all this sort of stuff. I see him as such a, like, honestly, I see he does God's work every day. Totally. Yeah. The yeah. only thing I just, I worry that the message gets conflicted with the young kids because they just watch him mm. and they see, all right, well, Spaniards coming to town. We've got to get out there. We've got to tell our most hectic story. Yeah, These yeah. Got, let's talk about the time that someone got stabbed here and mm. then let's do donuts and let's just go, let's be the sickest cunts we can because Spaniards in town. Yeah. So I just worry that it might have a, because he's becoming so popular mm. with that hood mentality that it can have a, a reverse effect. That's the thing. I know exactly know? what you mean, bro. Yeah. And I've watched, you know, I've watched influence in years and years and years of hip hop. I've watched rappers rap about getting on the pipe. And then I've seen their fans get on the pipe. Oh, yeah. You know, and I've, it's art imitating life. Sort yeah, of exactly. Thing. Yeah. And I've actually had this chat a couple of times in the last few days because people have a very similar, they're like, mm, what's this becoming? Yeah. You know, I, I uh, linked Spanion up with Riley P in Darwin for the Palmerston yeah, saw that, uh, Hood yeah. Tour. And that was the best, bro, because I worked in that community with those kids. And then all of a sudden, Spanion comes to town, you know. When I was in jail, I watched this thing on ABC News about Darwin hip-hop. And in my mind, I was like, I want to put Darwin on. And Riley sent me a letter when I was in jail. <coughs> and so five years later, Spanion hits me up and he's like, hey, bro, who do I go? You know what I mean? I've just been yeah. in Darwin making music with all the youth. And then Spanion's like, where do I go? I linked him up with Riley. Boof. All of a sudden, the whole country is watching, yeah. you know, these young fellas. Ezra, who wrapped in that vlog, he put up his video clips on 100,000 views. You know what I mean? Triple yep. J is trying to get that for artists. Yeah. You know, Spanion is doing more work right now for local hip-hop in the country than Triple J is. 100%. And he's just cruising around going, you know. Like I just he's... hope that the youth gets that he's trying well, to is... – uh, that they don't take that as a, as a template for how to – do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you he mean. Is the, he's the right person to look up to. Mm. The people that he's talking to and the kids that are doing donuts and doing, being, doing dumb cunt shit, that's not the right person to look up to. But that's happening. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like if you go to, you know, suburbs in Tassie like Clarendon Vale, I did a lurk vlog there. 
It's burnouts. It's chaos. Chaos has happened in that suburb for mm-hmm. fucking thirty years, man. It's a I cut-off just hope suburb. That you get what they're taking out of it. That's the thing. Well, this is the thing, man. I think there's so much on the internet now that we're really starting to see the difference between good and bad. Yeah. And doing my vlog and lurking around Tassie over the summer, I meet so many young fellas on the street, and in my experience. The majority want to do good. I can tell the the couple that don't because they don't like me. Yeah. And you know, a lot of cunts think, "Oh, Greeley's a happy go lucky cunt. He wants to talk about this, that." Blah, 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 blah. Those cunts when I walk past them, they just go, and I'm like, "Oh, good, bro." You know, like, yeah. bless them. And yeah. um, but I think that people see it for what it is. Yeah. And I think as well. Communities that might be turning it on too much, they get a bit of a mirror. They might be able to get, you know, a lot of these communities don't have a mirror. No, you know what I mean. But Whereas, no one else is going there. Yeah, exactly. Who but else I, is going to Melton? Yeah, for with sure. With a camera. Man. Yeah, yeah, fully. But I think that, I think it. In my experience as well, it was like fucking putting myself out there on the internet and also making bad decisions. You know, fucking dealing with drugs, fucking being violent, all that sort of stuff. Mm. Putting myself on the on the internet has eventually led to me holding myself accountable. Mm. So, I think um, even if Spanion wasn't doing this stuff, shit's happening, and people are looking up to other bad guys. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like a lot of the, like you know that murder on my mind song. You know what I mean? But like if Spanion's going to Melton and then getting out and going, fellas, why is all fighting over postcodes? That's bullshit. You know, fucking. Praise Jesus Christ. Thank you, thank you for dying for our sins. I'm like, fuck, this is great. You know, yeah. like I really, I think he's doing God's work. And, you know, unfortunately, not everyone's going to see the light. That's just how it is. Yeah, I But totally... for the ones that do, yeah, for the ones that see him come to town and see this thing and they go, oh, I'm going to follow him. And they see he's like, yeah, I'll go to the gym. I eat well. I praise God. Yeah. You know, I'm good with my wife. You know, he, like Spanion's not a fucking dickhead. He's not out here cracking on the chicks and using his fame for this. He's not out there. You know, like he's a man of faith. faith. Yeah. And it's um. So I think that's yeah. I hope that that message comes across, but yeah. I can see how other people would see the other side of it. Oh, I of totally co- get it. Of man. course, man. It's a very interesting one. Yeah. But like, I I love especially what he did for the Northern Territory in Alice. Um, in Karama and Palmerston because... No one shines a light on that. No, and the news, like NT News, they were like pissed off Spanion came to town because all of a sudden the rest of the country actually gets to see what's fucking happening. Yeah. You know, I've that, never seen that shit. Exactly, I've lived bro. here for 40 years. Exactly, man. Like I saw it when I was living in Palmerston at night. Yeah. Riley and I would cruise out at night and go talk to all the fellas in the street, you know, and... But once again, I found so much love up in those communities mm. because I didn't have fear in my eyes and I didn't have fear in my heart. Yeah. Um, I got nothing but love, mm. you know. And then I got – even when I've come across young fellas in the street with machetes, it was fucking love because I, I rolled out there with that. Yeah. But then I get back to Melbourne, right, and I get on the train and I see a couple of lads on the train hiding their knives and I'm like, hey, go on, fellas. And they're like, what do you want? <laughs> you know, and I'm like – Nothing, bro. It's all good. Sure. But when I realised as well, like, fucking, we've got a different fear down here. Different, yeah. You know, up there, especially with the mob, there's such a beautiful energy and spirit. And, you know, they're warriors, man. Like, mm. and this is where we see things like in Alice Springs that people don't understand cultural war. They don't understand this practice, but it comes with so many different blessings that we don't understand because we come from a different culture, you know. For sure. Um, you mentioned on your men, bleh, you mentioned your lurking videos and mm. your vlogs. Do you want to break that down for us and people that don't really know, man? Yeah, so I started it a couple months ago. I've actually been slack since I come to Melbourne, and I haven't done any because I got here and uh, hosted the Break and Bread show, and then I've just been creating again, man. I didn't really write for a, the last year while I was on my healing journey. I did a few collabs and I did the Connection series where I was like linking up with big gangs of rappers and, you know, let's do it. But I wasn't really writing from here. I was just flexing and connecting things up and just doing the hip-hop culture. Whereas, like, I've been here for two weeks, man. I've written some of the best shit I've written in 10 years. It just, it's like I had to get out of Tassie because I love Tassie so much, but I'm very well known down there. Um, Wherever I go, people are watching me. Uh, It's almost to the point where it affects my nervous system quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And because I've got lots of, you know, pain down there that um, 
I'm definitely fucking doing my best not to carry, but there is a lot of triggers down there for me as mm-hmm. well. So, yeah, as soon as I got here, man, it started pouring out, feeling good, and I'm like, fuck yeah. You can yeah, hide man. in plain sight a little bit more here. Yeah, I, like I can walk through Melbourne City and not get recognised once, and I don't have a problem with being recognised. I love when people um, share good energy with me because they feel connection, you know, and I love – I really don't like leaving anyone behind, but if I walk through Hobart, it'll take me an hour to get 100 metres up the road, mm-hmm. and by that point – I've given out so much energy and thankfully I found God because God fills my cup and fills my cup enough that I can pour a bit out for others. But still there's times where I have to allow God to help me put myself first and yeah. have a bit of a boundary, yeah. To people that you've known for a long time, when you tell them about your sort of spiritual stance now, are they – Shocked? Are they into it? Yeah. Do they want to hear more? They're definitely shocked. Shocked, yeah. Because I was not about it. Yeah. You know, but um, some people do, some people don't, man. That's really what it is. And it comes down to really their religious trauma. Depends what trauma they've had in regards to their experience with religion or religious people. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, so many, well, the church, so many people put themselves above God. But God, once again, is unconditional love, forgiveness, and acceptance. So regardless of you and I and what we agree on, I've got love for you. And if I, th- if I think that you think something's bad or you're like, no, nah, fuck, I praise the devil. I go, well, I forgive you, brother. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm not going to fucking die with a crucifix. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's – Yeah. That's, that's really what it is for me. One, one mm. thing as an atheist type person I can't really understand is that I think so much of the world's trauma comes from religion. Because people agree. can't agree on something. But once again, that's men. Yes. And the thing is, religion tries to put itself up above God. Mm. You know what I mean? That's the biggest problem, man, is that, like, I feel like I know God now, but I don't. It's not up for me to, t- you can't do this, you can't do that. And it's hard. It's hard. It's hard when you find your own alignment with your morals and stuff as you're having this sort of experience. And it's hard when you're aligned with people that have different morals because I've definitely had that as well. Mm. Like as I've changed and my morals are changing, the more I awaken and I realise who I truly am and what I want in my life. Unfortunately, not everyone that I've shared my life with is going to be a part of that because they're here with their morals. And that's a hard one because I love them, you know. Has it affected friendships and future relationships and that sort of thing though yeah it definitely has man yeah. it's affected stuff with their families it's, you know all sorts of things mm. it's very interesting man some people are like nah fuck off like big time yep. and i've had to just go love yeah. you and walk away man yeah. like because not everyone's ready as you said everyone's at a different part of their journey yeah. and um yeah some people are, are very triggered by it for sure mm. um Man, let's talk about some more musical yeah. stuff we've got on a thing. Well, what, look, you've obviously done a lot of music and we can talk about all that sort of stuff, but I'm more interested mm. in you as a person and what your journey is. So what That's else right. is what else is happening? You know, I'm not going to talk about all the albums and all this. Yeah, stuff. yeah. Like, and it's specific, specific tracks. I don't want to do that. Mm. What else are you going to do moving forward? You've mentioned the Breaking Bread stuff, but what else do you want to do with your lurks or do you want to do more of your stand-up comedy or what? what else is coming up? Oh, I'm really enjoying, really enjoying um, the vibe with Breaking Bread Productions. I've made some really good new friends. I'm connecting with people in a different way because, uh, yeah, I've really separated myself from the ego of hip-hop. I don't care who you are or how many followers you got. If you do hip-hop, I do hip-hop. We're good. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and I really want to kind of lean back from all of that. Uh, just the ego sides of things, man. Like, I meet so many young rappers that, like, put me on the pedestal and be like, oh, Grills, I ain't shit. And I'm like, brother, do not say you're not shit. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I hate that stuff. You know, I'm not above or below you, right beside. And um, so, yeah, I just want to create, bro. Yep. And creating is sharing what you and I are doing now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's been great meeting you properly and yeah. meeting Danny and, and connecting up. Um, and I just want to keep sharing. And yep. that's it. So the vlogs, they help me share this stuff. When I do stand-up, it's the same thing. I definitely want to – I want to go hard and 
you know, after this battle event, uh, break and bread battles, I want to do heaps more stand up around Victoria. I want to go out to like Ballarat, Bendigo, come down here. I'll do mm -hmm. some stand up down here. We got Aubrey Wodonga. I've never been up there before. Um, do you know Goxie? He's always messaging me, man. He's he's doing the fucking the rounds. You should yeah, come right. Goxie, all those regional yeah. places, man. Sweet man. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, he definitely. loves that sort of stand up shit. Yeah. Sick, bro. Yeah, and I'll link up with them, man. I'm keen as I'm keen as to network with the right people that. A leading with the right energy, bro. You know, I haven't got too much time for for any bullshit these days. I just want to create, hang out with good people, um, and do what I love. Because yeah, even the stand up shows, man, the ones that I've been doing, I'm learning. I'm having lessons from God through them. Do you know what I mean? So it's all like, coming back to God. It does, man. Because God isn't everything, bro. Like yeah. for example, even what, I did one in Perth, and I went and caught up with a friend group that have all separated now. You know mm. what I mean? Just because and they weren't seen eye to eye. Yeah, like, small yeah. town syndrome, bro. You know, it's the same in Tassie. You know, social circles change. They grow, adapt. Some people break up, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, um, yeah, and I caught up with a few friends in Perth that really didn't see eye to eye, eye, to eye and didn't want to be in the same room. And, you know, I told them all. I was like, I love yous and I want you to come to this gig. And yeah, they're going to be there, but you don't have to talk and it's going to be all good, you know. And mm. within a week, man, I'm standing in a room looking at all these people that I love and all of a sudden, because they were in the same room and they were laughing together harmoniously, that tension disappeared. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and for me, that was a sign of God that like even when they resisted and I went, nah, I love yous, mm. you know, and this is about love. I understand there's been shit in the past, but I'd like to see you guys all together because I love you all equally, you know, yeah. and for me, that's a sign of God, man, you know, like sure. I caught up with Complete in Perth when I was there and um, Complete, you know, like he, he raps about it a lot, but he struggles with drinking and I had a big chat to him about... He talks about mental health. Mental too, health, drinking, you know, all that sort of stuff. He's got a vulnerable personality yeah. on the mic, what, the oh, way man. he does it, but it's amazing. He's a beautiful human, bro. Yeah. Sheldon's one of my very good friends and I'm very grateful to know him. And I caught up with him and had this big chat about it because, yeah, he was struggling at the time. And the next day, uh, and, I, and I mentioned, you know, God to him and, and he was like... You know, he was worried that I might judge him. I was like, no, brother, you know, this is love. Like, and then, um, yeah, I left Perth and then when Tassie came to Tassie, I mean, Complete came to Tassie not long ago on his tour. He got up on stage and he was like, fucking, this is the first time I've done a tour sober. And, man, I heard God in my head go, see? You know what I mean? And yeah. I was just like, wow, you know, um, I just, as i got to give it to God, man. Like, the more that I try and share this love with the people around me if they're open to it yeah. and complete you know i can tell he's open to my love man because we're brothers bro we've been through hell and back as well i've i've just got to ask man that your religious ideals they can't always align with you've got two major passions that i can tell right mm. now just talking to you today god and hip-hop mm. and those those ideals can't not always line up. So how do you feel about that? Because hip-hop isn't always a righteous kind of pastime. No, no, no. And how does that – is that a confliction with, with what you, your two major passions, do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean, bro. Yeah. Because I didn't like Christian hip-hop either, you know what I well, mean? Well, like, Yeah, see? yeah. But I see that – I think that everything – I see all creations – are an act of God, you know what I mean? And this is how, yeah, it's a very, it's an interesting one, man, because there are some negative creations in the world. Yeah. But at the same time, I had to go through negative shit to find God. Right. Yeah. You know, I listened to negative hip hop that when I was a kid that made me, that definitely influenced me to be violent, influenced me to take drugs. But I had to go to prison to find God. And so let's say the hip-hop I listen to is still a creation of God because somewhere it got me to finding God. And that's where you see that everything happens for a reason and that's the gratitude that you can find in the darkness where the light comes. You know what I mean, bro? 100%. Yeah. So it's, I knew you'd find it back there. Yeah. You did. I was, I was curious to how it was going to come back. But you yeah. did it, man. Yeah. It's definitely like, yeah, when – and this is the thing, especially hip-hop, like when you're a victim, you know – 
victim that comes with the, you know, God isn't interested in suffering, right? So if you're a victim, you're like, oh, shit's shit, shit's fuck, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I wanted to get better. It won't, you know what I mean? You have to, you have to have that faith and move forward for things to fucking get better. And you, when you're in a victim situation, you have to create to that's something that's going to pull you out of that victim situation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, I had a turbulent upbringing, trauma. I found hip-hop. It created something that changed my life. Lots of positives, negatives too. But it put me into a place where I had to find God, where I found God and saw it was all for that reason, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, it's... um. And that's the hard one, man, because there's some fucking horrible shit happening in the world, you know, like what's happening with Palestine and fucking all this sort of stuff. And it's like, well, how does God work in this? You know, because these people are claiming we're God's people so we can fucking genocide you. You know, it's very complicated. But I feel that if anyone puts themselves above God and they act in these sorts of ways, they're going to have to deal with the repercussions of it, whether it's in this realm or the next one, yeah. you know, whatever you decide that is. I feel that there is, I feel that there's a pendulum that swings and I feel that energy is transferable and it's like waves and it comes in and out. So mm. I, I, I've got to give it to God. That's the other thing is that he knows. He knows. It's not up to me. He'll sort it out. <laughs> They'll have their realisation when they when they do. Some people don't, you know. Yeah. But it's not up to me. Oh. Mm. Man. We've done almost two hours and it's been a great chat. Oh. And I'm sure there's plenty more stuff that we could talk about and I'd love to have you back, man. I, bro, I let's reckon do it. you'd be a great guest to come back like every couple of months, man. Yeah, man. You let's do it, bro. Down here, it'd be sick. Yeah, let's do it, bro. I really enjoy meeting you, brother. And thank you so much for having me on here. It's been a pleasure. You've got a dope space. I love everything you're doing with this podcast. Thanks, Make man. sure you like and subscribe. <laughs> 3,000 podcasts. Let's go. Thanks, let's man. Go. Thank you, man. And one last time. Breaking bread, when's it happening? April 6th, it's going to be at the Lead Beater Hotel in Richmond. Uh, we've got some amazing matchups. We've got Eric Devine versus Eros. We've got Scrub versus Uncle Encore. We've got Harlem versus Phoenix. We've got Sweats versus Verka. I'm going to battle Hoey Farmer. It's going to be the best vibe. Get your tickets on OzTix. Make sure you follow Breaking Bread Productions on Instagram. Check them out. Get amongst it. Let's bring hip hop back again proper. Sick, Grills. Thanks for coming, man. I'm fucking looking forward to seeing you again soon, but I appreciate you making the trek this time. We'll see you next time, man. Thanks for coming. Thank you, bro. Cheers. God bless. Yeah, <laughs> cheers. Oh, man.